fantastic, it's a job. And, and his agent says, okay, I have more news for you. The show goes up tonight. Moore goes, oh my god, it's going up tonight, I'm supposed to memorize it. And he says, don't worry, it's one line. Okay, and I don't want you to be upset. He says, no, no, it's okay, it's one line. There are no small parts, only small actors. What's the line? Agent says, the line is, hark, I hear the cannons roar. Moore goes, hark, I hear the cannons roar. I love this line. I love this part. I can act the hell out of this line. He says, okay, so here's the thing. It's, it's, it's 10 o'clock in the morning now. Curtain goes up at 8 p.m. It's, it's down at the Broadway Theater, okay? And you've got to be there by 6 o'clock, so they get you to make up, get you to costume. Curtain's up at 8, they'll be waiting there for you. Maury says, thank you, thank you, Fred. This is so terrific. I'm so happy. Thank you. Maury is so happy that he goes to the local bars, buying drinks for everyone, gets himself well and truly plastered, goes home, sleeps it off, wakes up, it's 7.30. He's going, oh my god. He drives like a maniac to the theater. The entire time, he's running his line. Hark, I hear the cannons roar. 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 He gets to the theater. He's banging on the outside door. It's now, at this point, 7.55. Stage manager opens the door and says, who the hell are you? He says, I'm Hark, I hear the cannons roar. He says, you're Hark, I hear the cannons roar. Oh my god, I get the makeup. We've been waiting for you. Maury runs like a madman, gets to the makeup. Makeup woman says, who the hell are you? He says, I'm Hark, I hear the cannons roar. She says, oh my god, you're Hark, I hear the cannons roar. Quick, sit down. She throws the makeup on. She says, quick, get down the costume. They're waiting for you. This is insane. The curtain's going to go up in two minutes. He runs the costume. The costume person says, who the hell are you? He says, I'm Hark, I hear the cannons roar. She says, you're Hark, I hear the cannons roar. Quick, here's your costume. He throws the costume on him. He goes running to the stage wing where the, the curtains are still closed. And there is standing the nervous director pacing back and forth. He says, who the hell are you? He says, oh, I'm Hark, I hear the cannons roar. He says, you're Hark, I hear the cannons roar? Thank God. We didn't know where you were. The curtain's about to go up. There, there's your mark. Get ready. And he pushes him out into the stage. He hits his mark. The curtain opens wide. A spotlight hits him. From behind him, there is a thunderous roar. He jumps five feet in the air and he screams, what the fuck was that? <laughs> okay.
but I've been doing this real for a real long time. So I'm kind of hoping that I know enough about what the hell I'm doing so that I can convey this to you in probably no consistent, coherent fashion, but that I will be able to impart to you as much as I know of writing within two hours. And the first thing I can tell you is that whatever it is that you think you know of writing, you don't know anything. Okay? There was a long time ago, uh, there was a magazine called Comic Scene. Okay? And there was an interview with an artist who showed the papers. And he said in the course of the interview that if he was 10, 15, 20 years from then, no better than he was right at that moment, he'd be perfectly happy with that. And I read that, and I was appalled. Because as a creator, if you are ever satisfied with what you've done, if you ever say, this is, this is good enough, you have just condemned yourself to going into creative spin cycle. Okay? You always have to be willing to advance, you have to be willing to try new stuff, and you have to be willing to hone your craft. This was kind of proven to me personally. When I cut a deal with uh, Ace Books. They published a book of mine in 1986 called Nightlife, about King Arthur returning to modern day New York and running for mayor. Mm -hmm. And some 10, 15 years later, um, since they had gone out of print, I cut a deal with them to not only bring it back into print, but we would do a we make a three book deal out of it, and it would be the first of a trilogy, and I would go back into the original novel and just update it. Because 15 years is a millennium when it comes to everything from technology to social and cultural references. There were people that I referred to in nightlife who were popular at the time, and now it's 15 years later, and you wouldn't know who the hell they are. Then again, we're living in a world where people are going, Paul McCartney, I never heard of it. So, you know, if anything indicates the passing way in which people look at this stuff, and I sat down and read the novel for the first time in 15 years. And I was appalled at my own work because all I could see were the massive flaws in this book. And it put me in mind of when I had first been trying to sell it. My agent had been sending it around. And she sent the first 100 pages on an outline, which is how you traditionally move a book, you know, try to move a book. And she sent, she sent the first 100 pages and the outline to various publishers. And one of the women, one of the people that she sent it to, was a woman named Judy Lynn Del Rey, who was the founder of Del Rey Books, which is around to this day, long after Judy's gone. And Judy read it, and she sent it back to my agent with a note. And the note said, I could barely wretch my way through the first hundred pages of this manuscript, I could not imagine vomiting my way through the rest of it. I would be very interested to see who buys this. And keep in mind, I have not sold any novels yet. So anyone who feels that they're getting, you know, anyone who feels they're getting tough judgment for editors, I'll throw Judy Lynn Del Rey at you any day of the year. Uh, which I could, which was about that big. So. At any rate, um, and the book was eventually published by Ace, but now in looking at the book with 15 years distance and you know, experience under my belt, I looked at it and I was appalled at, to, to my mind, how bad the writing was. You know, um, and the plot was not what it should be, and I saw all the places where I had cut corners because I simply didn't have the skill or the patience or the experience to do justice to what the book demanded. And what was originally supposed to be simply a cosmetic change, I was going to change typewriters to computers, you know, that kind of thing, became a massive rewrite. The original novel was 65,000 words. The revised novel was 95,000 words. It literally was long enough to be nominated for a Hugo as a brand new book. And 
it also just, you know, the Julia Lynn Del Rey anecdote just also puts me in mind of the notion that the first thing, the first thing that you must develop if you have any intention of becoming any kind of a writer, much less a comic book writer, is a massively thick skin. Okay? This will prepare you not only for rejection by editors, but also, even worse than rejection by editors, the reactions of the fans if you're lucky enough to become a professional and get your stuff out there. Because it can be brutal. And if you let it get to you, you will go out of your mind. I mean, you absolutely will. The thing that you always have to understand about the work is that it's not you. Okay? It may represent your thoughts. It may represent feelings that you have about various things, various subjects. But it's not you. You have to separate yourself from it. Because when they're criticizing the work, the work is the work. And you are a separate entity from the work. And there are authors who didn't learn that. Uh, John Kennedy Toole was a wonderful author who wrote a book called A Confederacy of Dunces. Brilliant book, rejected by every publisher in town. He committed suicide. He couldn't, he couldn't stand the rejection. And his mother eventually managed to get it published, and it won what, the Pulitzer Prize? Right? And it's one of the great things that Hollywood has still not managed to find how to crack in order to get it into a movie, which we can actually probably be all thankful for that. But you really, before you work on the, before you commit yourself to the work, before you dive into this, separate yourself from it. Take a mental step back. If an editor says they want things changed or they don't get it, you know, you, have, you can't take that personally. Okay? Even if people are calling you names, and they will, you can't take it personally. You, you've got to be able to shine this stuff on. Um, and I, I've got to tell you, I mean, people think that it's the, that you have a thin skin sometimes. You know, you said, there's no right way to deal with it. I had a Star Trek novel come out, and it was a Mr. It was a Mr. It was focused on Mr. Sulu, and a fan wrote a scathing review of it online. They said, you know, Peter Davis' latest Star Trek novel is terrible. And I read the review, and I went, okay, well, you know, like Ed Wood, well, the next one will be better, you know. <laughs> um, he paid his money, he stated his opinions, okie dokie. If you're a paying customer, and you read it, and you have opinions that didn't like it, okay, you're entitled. Three days later, he posted a new thread. Peter David doesn't give a damn about his fans. <laughs> Why, you may ask? Why? Why? How come? Rugged individualism. Because I hadn't posted a response to his initial uh, negative review. I had not defended the work. You know what? The work is the work. It doesn't need defending. It should speak for itself. Okay. Uh, but, uh, by the way, as I natter on, um, if any of you have questions, rather than just wait for a question period at the end, where you're going to have to sit there and, tr and try to remember the question that you want to ask an hour and ten minutes earlier, and I myself would have to remember what the hell I was saying for the context of it. <laughs> if you have questions as we go, feel free to just toss up your hand and, and, I'll, a and I'll be happy to answer it as best I can, and maybe we'll even send stuff off into some new and interesting direction. As long as it's a question pertinent to what I'm talking about. You know, so for example, if I'm talking about plotting and you raise your hand and go, what the hell is going on with you and Tom McFarland, that's a little bit off the track. Okay? So, there is, now I'm going to be talking a lot in general strokes about writing in general. Okay? Um, and I will also be talking about how this applies to comics. But, you really have to lay the foundation, you know? So what I intend to discuss with you, just so you know that I do have a plan, okay? 
I'm going to talk to you generally about, first of all, characterization and building characters. I'm going to talk to you about building a plot. Then I'm going to, um, I've got some, some script material I'm going to go through. Once, once we have the basics of characterization and plot, I'm then going to discuss with you in broad strokes how some of the plotting mechanisms apply to such things as Terminator, or Terminator 2, which is a great mechanism for plotting, and also Watchmen. Can I safely assume that everyone in this room has read Watchmen? Has anyone not read Watchmen or seen the movie? Okay, that just, that just says, is anyone embarrassed to admit that they have not read Watchmen before? Okay, we're good. Um, I will also go over um, scripting that I have done to give you examples of how in some of my, in, in one of my scripts, I address certain aspects of plotting and scripting and characterization. I will also go over an example of scripting in which we will see how the artist actually implemented the descriptions of what I put forward. Because I gotta tell you, that's, that's a learning process in and of itself. Okay, just, just to give you a comic related anecdote before we start going right into characterization stuff. I was doing a five part, maybe six part, Dread Star limited series. Is there air conditioning in here? It is, but it's very loud, so. How, because I bet I can get above it. How loud does it go? See, do you know how to turn it on? Give it a whack. Let it rip. Literally. It's very loud. I'm a middle-aged fixing Jew. This goes on about 20 more minutes. <laughs> Can everyone hear me? Excellent. Is the thing going to be able to pick me up still? Uh, probably, but it'll probably last a lot of background noise. Looking. Okay, okay, well, if you, want, get. if you want to give me a mic, then we can get above the air condition. But so I'll you, talk in the meantime. You know how to set up the mic? No, okay. Okay. Knows how to set up the mic and go on. okay, if you're watching this, we are placing the comfort of everyone in this room, including me, above your ability to hear what I'm saying. So suck it. Okay. You should have come. Now I'll teach you. Okay, transfer, right. So I was doing the first issue of the of transfer, and I put in my panel description. What I wanted of our first shots of a planetary surface, an alien surface that was covered with jungle and all that kind of thing. And I wanted a five panel sequential in which we are drawing closer and closer to the, uh, to the planet's surface. So you can all picture this, right? If you're not having, if you're, you know, think about the opening of, of Birdcage, right? Or Lethal Weapon, two films that are very similar. Uh, in which you have that, that kind of establishing shot. And I get the first pages back to look over. And there is on the first page a Black Hawk helicopter. And it is, there's a little guy in there with machine guns. And he's firing the machine gun at the panel board. And I'm going, the hell is this? What, what is this helicopter doing on my alien world? And I went back to my script and I looked at it and I went, because what had I written? Helicopter shot of an alien world. <laughs> now apparently the, the artist didn't know what that was. He'd never heard of the film term. So he looked at it and went, damn it, this is what the writer wants, then this is what he's going to get. It didn't make any sodic sense to the artist, but he felt that there had to be some reason for Peter wanting a beautifully drawn, I should add, a beautifully drawn, meticulously detailed, and I felt bad for him because he didn't have to go do the research to look up what this for the helicopter looks like. So, you know, kudos to the artist for that. Did you have a No, you have a Okay, that's fine. So, anyway. Characterization. Right? There is an ongoing debate in writers, in, in writing circles, about which is more important, characterization or the plot. Now, the obvious answer to that is they're both important. Okay? Without a, 
compelling character, you can have the greatest plot in the world, and the, the readers will not be invested in that plot because they won't care enough. Right? There has to be something in the character that makes the character appealing to the reader. It has to make them in some way connect. There has to be something about that character, preferably some sort of easily identified weakness or some laudable personal accomplishment or stature that will give the reader the ability to latch on and see pieces of himself in that character. That's what identifiability is. Okay? You are asking people to care about what happens to pretend characters. These characters aren't real, but you have to make them. Because everybody in the world who reads a book or sees, reads a comic or sees a movie or watches a television is filtering their perceptions through the prism of their own experience. And you have to hope that you can find something within the lives that they have led that they will be able to connect with that character. That there will be something in the road past or that will remind them of somebody that they know, brother, sister, friend, significant other, that they'll go, yes, I am willing to suspend disbelief, okay, which is something that a lot of people get wrong. They go, you're going to suspend belief. No, suspend disbelief, okay? The concept being that, you know, the inclination is not to care about the characters. That's the first inclination, because we all know that these guys are made up. But there has to be something in there that makes you want to connect, okay? Um, and the best way, the first and most fundamental way to come up with characters along those lines is to observe the world around you. I mean, you look at artists, right? The great artists like Jack Kirby, who are incredibly, who draws incredibly exaggerated, Drew, incredibly exaggerated characters, nevertheless, knew the real world cold. He knew human anatomy cold. He then was able to exaggerate for comic effect, okay, or, or more heroic effect. People don't really walk around like this. If you enter a room and say, hello, I'm Captain America, people are like, what the hell is this guy? Do we have severe jock age? What is with this? <laughs> but Kirby was able to make it work because he knew how to exaggerate, because he knew reality, okay? The problem is that the subsequent generation of artists, rather than, stuff, and this is just sweeping, this is not everybody, obviously, but the, 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 there were subsequent generations of artists who did not study human anatomy. They studied Kirby, and then they exaggerated Kirby. And all of a sudden, you're getting Captain America with a chest that goes out to there. It's like, you know, we all know what I'm talking about. And it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. You know, they have, and just as it is an artist's obligation to know and understand human anatomy, it is the writer's obligation to know and understand people. Okay? To understand what makes them tick. To observe the world around you. Uh, some weeks back, actually a couple of years back, I was sitting in a subway. Uh, I was going from 34th Street up, you know, it was uh, like the E train or something like that. I don't even remember where I was going. And this woman, very attractive woman, walks in. And, she's, and she gets in around 34th Street, and she's standing there. And I observe her. That's all I do. I observe her. And the train goes from 34th to 53rd Street. And as she's about to get off, I say to her, good luck with your acting audition. And she says, thank you. <laughs> like that, and as the door's closed. And the people, and she's staring in at me like that, and I'm just sitting there. And some people go, do you know her? I went, no. They said, that, then how did you know she was going to act? I said, how did you not? Okay. I looked at this woman, okay, which was not that 
toughness on me. Okay? First off, very attractive hair, perfectly done. She was wearing a fairly, uh, what, what do you call it, not like a corset, but um, kind of, of like a bustier type outfit, you know, from, from the top up. Very, very sexy looking, okay? Showed her off very nicely. Kind of, you know, well, like I said, attractive, provocative, right? But her dress, she was wearing a skirt, came to here, okay? It was, it was a very modest skirt. So this is not a woman who was dressing as it was a cheap, right? And I looked at her and I looked how her makeup was perfect, her hair was perfect. This was sexy, this was modest. And I'm sitting there going, okay, she could be a model, but the way that she's dressing, it looks to me like she's trying to convey range. You know, I can be sexy, I can be modest. Maybe she's an actress. She's certainly someone who wants to be looked at. How do I know this? Because she's carrying a large plastic bag. A large, like, you know, like a woman's bag, right? Not, but it's not a purse, it's like a, it's too big to be a purse. And it says, my stuff. Which is good, because it says other people's stuff that I stole. You know, there could be issues. And it says, my stuff. And it's clear, right? You can see right into it. So this is someone who really wants to be looked at. So now I'm positive that I'm on the right track with either model or actress leaning toward actress. I look at the contents of the bag. I don't feel that I'm being invasive. It's there! Right? So I can say, hold on, can I look at your stuff? She has a pair of very comfortable shoes. This indicates to me that she's going somewhere where after she's done, she's going to change into more comfortable shoes. Going to work? I don't think so. Most, you know, most women who have shoes that they change out, they keep the they, they keep the more formal shoes at work, which they would then change into, and they'd be wearing the more comfortable shoes. Something that women started doing right when uh, when New York had its uh, uh, strike some years ago. Lots of women started walking to work, and they were all wearing sneakers because you can't walk in high heels. It's absurd because women hating men made high heels. So, but anyway. Uh, so usually women, so and that was something that kept up after uh, the strike ended because it was just so much more comfortable. So women walked to, shoot, walked to work in comfortable shoes. They had their high heel shoes or whatever were there. She's carrying the shoes with her. So she's going to some place that she doesn't usually go. And once she's done there, she's going to change into more comfortable footwear. So obviously she's going to some place in which she's trying to make an impression. Job interview or audition. Then I'm still looking, she's got a small yellow book published by Samuel French. Everyone know who Samuel French is? Anyone doesn't know? Samuel French is a publisher of scripts. They, pu they publish musical scripts, they publish uh, dramatic scripts. They, that's what they do, they publish plays, okay? She's got a book. She's got little markings. She's got, uh, I didn't see the title, but I didn't have to see it because I recognized the logo. And she's got like a little uh, post-it notes in sections of the play. Why is she having post-it notes? Probably sections that she was studying to do a reading, okay? Now I've got the whole thing. Going to an audition where she's going to do a reading, then change into more comfortable shoes, and go on to her next appointment of the day. It took me about, you know, 30 to 45 seconds. Sherlock Holmes could have done it in, you know, two, two seconds. You know, I'm no home. But at any rate, this is how I was able to put together this woman's particular history in no time at all. Now, this is something that I do all the time as a writer, purely as an exercise. I watch the world around me. I watch people around me. And I try to come up with backstories. They don't necessarily have to be accurate, but this particular woman, I just happened to nail it. But I will sometimes just sit on a bench, and if I'm you know, waiting for something, I've got some time to go, and I will watch people go by. I will listen to snippets of the things that they say. I will watch how they conduct themselves, their body posture, their nervous tics. Anything that I can develop, that I can use to develop characters, because that's going to be more genuine way to come up with characters, even superhero characters, 
than just trying to get your ideas from what other people have done for characters. It's all out there. There used to be a, a TV series way before the time of most of you. You will probably remember it. You will probably remember it. The Naked City. Yeah, yeah, okay? And the thing that they always started off with, it was an anthology dramatic series, and the announcer would always say, there are 10 million stories in the Naked City. This is one of them, right? And that's true. Everybody has a story. Everybody. Sometimes it's an incredibly dull story. <laughs> Sometimes it's a story that makes you want to bang your head against the wall. But everybody has a story. Anyone who watches uh, uh, any of these reality shows knows this. They look for, you know, and it drives me nuts when they have shows like Survivor, they refer to the people on it as characters. No! They're not characters. They're people. But you can take the things that they've gone through, you can take their personal attributes and takes and personalities, and make them characters. If you're developing stories, it is very common to use not only little bits of yourself, but friends of yours. You know, best friends, husbands, wives, parents, grandparents. Um, the world around you is provides a plethora of opportunities for you to put them into characterizations. And I can guarantee you this, if you write something and you have put your best friend or your parents or whatever into it, and you say, here, would you like to read this? And they go, sure. They will not recognize themselves. They absolutely will not recognize themselves. And you have to, you know, you can look to them for story ideas, because people always say, where do you get your ideas? Okay, that's a very common one. I've had people come up to me and say, I want to be a writer, but I don't have any ideas. What do I do? And I say, look for a different perfection. <laughs> people don't, and it's not like being an air conditioning repairman, or an electrician, or for that matter, a doctor, right? It's not something which you say, I would like to do this. And then you're going to figure out how. You become a writer not because you say, I think this would be an interesting gig. I now have to figure out how the hell to do it. You become a writer because your mind is wired in such a way that not being a writer is simply not an option. Because you're, you're, the ideas come to you, the characters come to you, the world comes to you in such a way that you have two choices. You must either write these things down, or you become, a, or you become a raging alcoholic or drug addict, or both. <laughs> there is a huge overlap. <laughs> huge. But the thing is, when you're a writer and an alcoholic, it's stylish. No, not really. Kids don't drink or do drugs. But really, it's, it's something that you feel compelled to do. And when you look at the world, the ideas are right in front of you. For instance, again, having nothing to do with comics, but what the hell? I was having a conversation with, with Harlan Ellis, you know, dear friend. I called him up and I said, Harlan, how are you doing? He says, oh, I'm dying. I went, oh my god, what's wrong? I said, is it your heart? No, no, heart's fine. He said, did you deliver it? What's going on? He says, yeah, well, and he proceeds to tell me this litany of things that's going on with him, all of which are easily attributable to the vagaries of a body slowly breaking down as it ages, but nothing that makes you, that's going to make a doctor say, you had better get your affairs in order. And I said, and he kept talking about that he was dying, and he was ready for it, and he was winding down, and all that kind of thing. And I said to him, you know, Harlan, and no matter what I'm trying to bring him to in terms of conversation, he'd come back to that he was dying. And I said, Harlan, I really wish you'd stop talking this way, because it's depressing the hell out of me. And he said, yeah, you know, everybody keeps saying that. <laughs> I wonder what the hell is wrong with everybody else. And I said, there's a story there. And I wound up writing a story called Brodsky's Days with Death about an old man who will not stop complaining. 
right, about, about death, that he's ready for death. So much so that even death doesn't want to take him, because he's sick of his adventure. I sold him to the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, okay? I was watching Superman, the movie, the, the original first movie, and I hadn't seen it for a long time, I hadn't seen it watching it, and there's Lois Lane fall, falling from the helicopter, and Superman catches her, and I'm thinking, Dan, you know, she was damn lucky that Superman happened to choose that day <laughs> to show up. And then I thought about Lois Lane's history and how accident prone this woman is. And I find myself going, how in the name of God did she survive puberty, much less grow up to become a reporter? It really doesn't make any sense. Now, I understand that it's a convention of comic books opposed to a comic book convention. But I thought, you know, there may be a story there. And I came up with an idea for a Superman story, which was that it's eventually revealed that Superman is actually, has, a, has an additional power that he never knew of, which is that he is causing these things to happen, that Superman's mere presence affects probabilities in such a way that shit goes wrong when he's around. And I thought, this is great. And then I went, this is stupid. Because you can't do any more Superman stories then. You're done. Because he's going to exile himself to wherever the hell, the moon, or whatever. So he doesn't hurt anybody else. So I went, OK. And I rejiggered the characters because these are really just iconic archetypes by now. And I called the short story The Archetype, and I sold it to FNSF, which is a really handy outlet for when I come up with stories. At any rate, any you know, you look at characterization, and characters lead to stories, okay? As one thing leads to another. Now, there are a lot of writers out there, a lot of comic book writers, who, God bless them, can come up with three, four, and five year arcs. And I think that is freaking amazing, okay? And they will come up with these lengthy stories and I have no idea how they do that because I cannot do that. So if you want someone who can do that, then maybe the next time like Joe Straczynski's around and he comes in and does talk, go to see him. Because if you want someone who can create an incredible detailed Bible and give you an idea of how to do a five-year arc. He's your man. That ain't me. I don't, I, my brain doesn't work that way. I have to approach it from the point of view of the character first. I can't, because to me, once you are really invested in the characters, the characters to some degree take over the story. And there are writers who lampoon this concept. They say, well, that's utterly ridiculous. You know, the notion that, well, what if the character wants to go off in this direction instead? You know, it's absurd. And my attitude is, no, it's not absurd, because it means that you were so wired into the character that he has that amount of reality to you. And I've got to tell you, if the character has that amount of reality to you, then with any luck, he's going to have that amount of reality to your reader, which is precisely what you and if you do not follow the character, the re if you take the character and force him to go off in the direction that you want to take him, purely for plot purposes, I can tell you right now, the audience is going to know. And it's going to be like nails on a chalkboard. And they may not realize it. Or they may, because I'm sure that there have been any number of times where you guys have seen a TV show, or watched a movie, or been reading a comic book, and sit there and you go, no. No, that character would not do that. And yes, in the real world, there are people who do things that is completely out of character. I mean, that soldier who blew away 16 people in what, Afghanistan, right? The guy who shot 60 people in Afghanistan, they're interview, you know, now they're interviewing friends, family, who are all going, no, that is completely against his character. 
he would never do that. So it does happen in real life, okay? But don't hinge your story on the notion of that he would never do that unless that's your story. If your whole story is about a guy acting out of character, fine. Psych is it, okay? But that then better be addressed. And the reasons for his acting out of character are the crux of your story. They cannot be a plot convenience. Because if they are, you will lose the reader and you will shatter the suspension of disbelief. Okay? Now, talking to superheroes directly, I can't tell you the number of times where people will come up to me, oftentimes kids, sometimes older, and they'll say, I have this great idea for a superhero. And they will tell me his name and they will tell me his superpowers. And I will always say, tell me about his character. And they go, well, the character is that he's got these superpowers. I go, no, 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 no. Tell me about who he is. What is his backstory? What is his personality? And most importantly, how are these reflected in his abilities? And he will stare at me. And then he will say, well, he's like Wolverine. <laughs> or he's like Green Lantern. Oh, really? Which Green Lantern? You know, Chip? I mean, no, what are we talking about? And they don't think it through. They think about the visualization, they think about the powers, and there is nothing, you know, I don't care what you got, you know, in terms of powers. What has to hook you in nowadays is the story. What well, is, is the character, I'm sorry. Because once upon a time, back in, back in the 30s, back in the 40s, you know, it may be that, that the, the, the power was enough. Because comics were new. So you had a guy who was super fast. And kids didn't understand that the Flash was just basically a modern day novel for Mercury, you know, or Hermes. They just said, wow, he's a human being who runs really cool. And it was aimed at seven year olds, eight year olds, nine year olds. They didn't care. But readers are now older and more sophisticated. And if comic books from the 1930s and 40s were coming out now, they'd get nowhere. Okay? Audiences, kids are savvier, adults certainly are. And they would go, this is ridiculous. And if you look at the comic books of the Silver Age, right, the early Marvels, the stuff that Danny and I loved when we were kids, you look at it now from an adult perspective and you're going, really? Really, Stan, that wasn't too contrived even for you? You know, to say nothing of the writing style. I mean, they would do a caption in an issue of Action Comics that nowadays Brian Bendis could get a whole 20 pages out of. <laughs> right? <laughs> the caption would be, and so, having said goodbye to his parents and Lois, a Superman then flies to the Ursa Major Galaxy, determined to take on the evil Lord of Einarth and save the people. But on his way, he spies something. Picture of Superman. What's that? It looks like, could it be that Superman is facing a giant squad of Binar Avengers? Turn the page. Yes, a giant squad of Binar Avengers seeming now closing in on Superman. Uh, as they were about to fire on him. Superman. They're firing! Yeah. Um, which is why my reaction when I first read the very first issue of Ultimate Spider-Man was they're doing in five issues what Stan and Steve did in ten pages. I mean, keep in mind, Spider-Man was Spider-Man's origin was Amazing Fantasy 15. It wasn't even the whole issue. There were like two or three other stories in 22 pages. Spider-Man was like ten pa ten pages then. Eleven. Eleven pages with Spider-Man. Five issues now, but they look gorgeous, didn't they? So at any rate. Um, we love you, Brian, really. Um, so, when you are developing, mean, see, I'm just going to go off on tangents. So, let me show you. Characters, right? Feel, every so often, I'm going to say, what was I talking about? So, I'm going to leave it to you guys to remember what the hell I was saying so I'll get back on track. When you are developing superheroes, and just out of morbid curiosity, morbid, how many people here are actually interested in breaking into comics, particularly superhero comics? Okay. Um, most of my experience, I should mention, is superhero comics. So, I mean, I love other books, particularly the work of Terry. But 
most of my experience is going to be in superhero comics. Okay? They are it's a very special, particular subset of writing comics. If you're going to write more reality-based comics, then essentially what you're doing is talking about taking and building everyday characters with their own problems, their own persona, and then figuring out a way to tell it visually, which is a whole other thing that I will get into. Okay? We may go over two hours. So, would anybody be upset if we went over two hours? Uh, or do you guys close See? up by tonight? Okay, we're going over two hours? We're going over one. Fans, pretty fantastic. As long as I'm on the 10.30 train, home, home. So, at any rate. Um, I think, what will I talk about for two hours? It's like, oh, it's 10 to 8. Okay. I've got nowhere. So. I, was, I wasn't worried. Man. Okay. <laughs> Probably the most perfect melding of superhero and personality was done in the Silver Age of comic books in Marvel Comics. And I'm not saying that simply because I work for Marvel Comics. I have always felt that way. I mean, DC Comics, the characters of DC, were essentially godlike beings, right? That had their origins directly traceable to many mythic icons. Um, whereas Marvel Comics seem to were the exact opposite. They started, and, and, and with the DC Comics, they would take these godlike characters and every so often give them some weakness, some totally, generally lame ass weakness. Superman was vulnerable to a green rock, which, by the way, first originated in the radio show. Um, uh, Martian Manhunter was vulnerable to fire for no particular reason. What the hell is fire doing on Mars anyway? You know, um, uh, green, the first Green Lantern was vulnerable to wood. The second Green Lantern was vulnerable to yellow, which means that you could essentially take out both Green Lanterns with a number two pencil. <laughs> a joke which I have said many times, and then got pissed off when it showed up with the Big Bang Theory. I'm going, hey, they got that from one of my earlier essays, bastards. <laughs> At any rate, um, so Aquaman comes out of water and he's dead in 60 minutes. Why 60 minutes? Why not 59? Why not 61? 60 minutes he's fine, 61 minutes he's dead? What? You know, the arbitrariness of their limitations just shows how ridiculous it was. You know, why wasn't Superman vulnerable? Why wasn't Superman vulnerable to wood? You know, it's, why, wasn't, why wasn't Green Lantern vulnerable to green rocks? That would make sense. But that's the way there was. Marvel, to my mind, did it right. They started at the human level and built upwards and built outwards. Okay? So look at the Fantastic Four. Look at the characterization and the close link with the powers that they manifest. And I know that others have tried to tie them into elemental beings and this kind of thing, but it was really character driven. Here was Reed Richards, the scientist, always exploring, always fluid in his thinking, which is the scientific method. What is the personification of science but stretching? Stretching to new horizons, stretching your thinking, reaching out further than you've ever gone before. That's what science is. That's what Reed Richards became the personification of. The Human Torch, what is a teenager but hot-headed, brash, right? Well, you can't get more hot-headed than if you are on fire. <laughs> the Thing, right? Here was Ben Grimm. He was big. He was strong. He was a bruiser. He became the personification of strength, of invulnerability. He became the Thing. And Sue Storm? for eight-year-old boys who were the target audience, was the ideal girl. She went away. Right? Because when you're an eight- or nine-year-old boy, what do you want girls to do? Go away. And then she developed a secondary power that was even better. She developed a force field. Either you didn't have to look at her, or you didn't have to touch her. Perfect! When you're eight. Right? Um, and I feel like I'm slamming poor Sue, but it's true. That's how 
boys see girls, right, at that age. So she was, I mean, yes, I admit that I, at that age, I was still crushing on Supergirl, right? So I moved a little beyond that. But at any rate, um, which is why I love writing Supergirl. Yes. Um, <laughs> she's mine now. <laughs> um, at any rate, that's why they were perfect. They went, so my attitude is that whenever you are looking to develop a character who's a superhero, his power set should in some way, shape, or form reflect the personality, become a manifestation of it. You don't want to be too on the nose about this. You don't notice that in no time did Reed say, I seem to develop elastic properties that are obviously a reflection of my desire to be, to be you know, my desire to explore all kinds of no. That's a little too on the nose, but you just want to have something that reflects the character's personality. Wolverine is a homicidal nut job. So fantastic. He's someone who's going to get to a lot of fights, so thank God he can heal. And he's got claws. Perfect. Right? Um, Spider-Man. This is a kid. Peter Parker is somebody who goes through, is going through high school, and he is treated with revulsion. He is treated with disgust. No girl wants him anywhere near him, near her. Trust me, I've been there. Right? As a former high schooler who barely survived the experience, I have so been there. So it is easy to connect with Peter Parker just on a human level. Just on a human level. And then he develops powers. And what does he develop? The most disgusting powers that you could possibly comprehend. He's like a spider. <laughs> who likes spiders? Really, I mean, yes, people who understand that spiders are all friends and manage to and create webs that develop, that are developed for the purpose of catching more harmful insects like mosquitoes or flies. Or, you know, screw that, he's a spider. And the immediate impulse when people see spiders is to go, oh shit. <laughs> so, what happens is that he just becomes an exaggerated version of the guy he is still inside of the costume. It's still the same guy. However, the difference is now he has anonymity. Right? So he can put on a mask and nobody knows who he is. And anonymity unleashes the inner smartass. As anyone who has spent 30 seconds on a bulletin board, <laughs> or a chat room will easily agree to. Right? So um, again, that's why Spider-Man is remains Marvel's flagship character because of not only the easy identifiability of the guy who gets smacked around, but the fact that his his outward appearance and his superpowers are a manifestation of that. Um, it I mean, Bill Cosby did a did a movie and talked about how um, people were advocating pot to him, how she, she, she you know, how, how pot is really great for him. And Cosby said, well, and Cosby said, well, and I asked, what makes pot so great? And I was told, well, it enhances your personality. And I said, yeah, but what if you're an asshole? <laughs> Which, when he did the routine, got a gargantuan laugh because Cosby always is a very clean thing. Chris Rock says asshole. It's like, yeah, okay. Cosby says asshole and you're gone. Because you're not really expecting that. But that's really true. The, the superpower or the manifestation should in some way, shape, or form enhance or reflect the personality of its bearer. Okay? Now, by the same token, if you're trying to develop villains for your hero, then you, what you want to do ideally is to have villains who in some way, shape, or form are reflections of that the particular hero that they are going up against. Um, because that way you've got to, to compare and contrast, but you are also showing the reader what it would be like if your hero went a little bit off track. That's why Batman and the Joker are such an irresistible pair, much more so than Batman and say the Manhattan, or Batman and the 
Penguin, you, you don't really think that if Batman went completely off the rails, he would suddenly be turn short fat and have an umbrella upset. But the Joker has a mask. Batman has a mask. The Joker is crazy. Batman is batshit. Okay? So there's always that, that, that dynamic. Superman, Lex Luthor, perfect matchup. Superman is invincible, has all these superpowers, but Luthor, pure brains, brains against brawn. Well, you know, that is a fascinating matchup because physically Luthor has no powers whatsoever, but it's mind against might. And that is an intriguing matchup. Although, when you think about it, the, and so the moral of the story is, the strong guy will always be able to beat up the smart, nerdy guy. <laughs> Well, gee, we knew that. <laughs> and we usually don't admire the strong God for beating up the smart and early God, which was actually part of the problem with Superman, particularly during the Silver Age. He was so freaking powerful that he had to do incredible, that every so often he had to do incredibly elaborate things just to keep himself interested. Like, you know, like so, someone say, like, you know, I'm going to shoot this gun at you, Clark Kent, to prove that you're Superman. Now, the person who shoot the gun, Clark would just dive out of the way, which would not be that big a deal. And, oh my God, thank God he missed Clark. People aren't really going to think about much beyond that. Instead, Superman's like, I'm going to shoot this gun at you, Clark. Superman would then, moving faster than the eye can possibly follow, fly around the world in the opposite direction so that he can come up from behind the gun. Right? Take his gun, empty out all the bullets, substitute blanks that he had picked up at a convenience store <laughs> on the way over, put the gun into the guy's hand, fly back around the world, and stand there and, and then change back, all the time changing his costume, because it's really going to be seen flying faster than the eye can see, so that when the guy shoots the blanks, he can fall over and people go, oh my god, Clark's dead, and you've got a nice cover image. <laughs> and then people go, look, he shot blanks at Clark Kent. What an asshole. <laughs> I love the Silver Age. <laughs> well, that's fun. At any rate, Fantastic Four, the ultimate villain of Fantastic Four, Dr. Doom, Reed Richards on a bad day. <laughs> but think about the direct contrast between Reed Richards and Dr. Doom. Reed Richards underwent an experiment in which he brought his friends along, he didn't think it through, over the advice of his best friend, Ben Grimm, who said, yeah, uh, cosmic rays, <laughs> they could fuck us up real good. He took them anyway. They cosmic rays, sure enough, fuck them up real good. They get back and Reed, guilt-ridden, says to Ben, I will never stop trying to find a way to change you back to being and for like a lot of the first hundred issues, Reed was always working on something. Apparently it was the only thing he could not do. Although in one or two issues he actually managed to do it and Ben changed himself back because of the story requirements. But he never stopped trying to come up with some way to restore Ben to humanity. Okay? Because he felt guilty. Now, compare that and contrast that to Victor Von Doom, who also rushes into a, an experiment. He wants to penetrate the netherworlds for reasons that will then be made uh, evident hundreds of issues later when other writers come up with a reason for it, uh, which is to find his dead mother who's in there or whatever the bullshit was. So at any rate, and Reed Richards looks at this and like Sheldon Cooper says, you know, these things are wrong. Does Dr. Doom say, does Victor Von Doom say, thank you for pointing that out? <laughs> oh my God, I hadn't noticed it. He says, give me that asshole. And he grabs it away and throws Reed out. He puts on the, the hair dryer from hell. <laughs> it explodes. His face is fucked up. And does he say to himself, mea culpa? Does he say, my bad? Does he say, memo to me? Never stick my hair head in the air dryer <laughs> well unless I'm 100% sure. No. Who does he blame? 
Reed Richards. He takes no guilt. He takes no personal responsibility whatsoever. Instead, he shifts all the blame to Reed Richards and says, I'm going to destroy that rat bastard. He somehow screwed up my experiment because he was jealous. Jealous, I said. To show how ridiculous this is, imagine Ben Grimm saying they're going, I'm a monster. And Reed Richards says, yeah, well, it's your fault because you didn't warn me enough about the cosmic effects. It's ridiculous. It's preposterous. But that shows the difference. And that's why Dr. Doom remains the quintessential opponent, not just of the Fantastic Four in general, but Reed Richards in specific. Which is why I was so brassed off about the first Fantastic Four movie. Because in the first in the first Fantastic Four movie, Doctor Doom winds up being, you know, transformed into this horrible thing, and he blames Reed Richards. Why? Because it's Reed's fault. Every step of the way, Reed could have averted the catastrophe that happened to Victor Von Doom. He didn't. It was his failure that leads to his, you know, turning into a villain. And here's the problem: he's really got a valid point. I mean, it doesn't condone destroying half the city to get to the Fantastic Four, but really, what the FF is then doing for the balance of the film is damage control to clean up after Reed's mess that created the supervillain, which is why that was inherently flawed. Now, also, okay, let me get to plot. Okay, we're going to talk more about characterization, let me talk about plot. Now, I do not, for one moment, pretend that I've come up with this, okay? I'm just going to reiterate for you, as fast as I can, basic plot structure that is very popular in not only movies, but also in comics, in novels. It's a fundamental skeleton, okay? You can do a vast array of things with skeletons because you know, the skeleton for Cameron Diaz is more or less going to be fundamentally the same as, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a really ugly woman. And not be, okay, let me rephrase. The skeleton for you, Jackman, is the same as mine. Okay? How's that for a frightening thought, kids? So the thing is, this, you know, the skeleton can be fundamentally the same, but what you're going to get on the outside, can look vastly different. Okay? But this is, you never realize how much I always say okay or right as an interjection. Right? Right? Okay? I sound like Mr. Mackey. You know, the drugs are bad, okay? At any rate, so, traditionally, typically, stories, whether they be two hours, whether they be a two hour movie, a 12 issue limited series, or a 10 episode television miniseries have the same fundamental structure. And there will be things that go on within the framework of the structure, but this is the overall structure. Okay? All right. First of all, there is Act One. In the course of Act One, this is where you establish the basics. It's where to my mind, the, the quintessential definition of Act One was in, of all things, the Muppets take Manhattan. No, the, the Great Muppet Cake. In the first 10 minutes of The Great Muppet Cake, Miss Piggy goes to work for a rich woman played by Diana Rigg. And Diana Rigg proceeds to tell her, she proceeds to give her an info dump. She says, Yes, you know, it's, it's been such a difficult thing lately with my brother, and she's laying out all this information. And Miss Piggy says the line that you hear very, very often in films, which is, why are you telling me all this? <laughs> you see this in all kinds of movies. Why are you telling me all this? And there's usually some bullshit explanation for it. And Diana Rigg answers 100% candidly. She says, it's exposition. It has to go somewhere. <laughs> This is where it goes. Generally speaking, this is where the exposition goes. 
you in you meet the characters, and you are given a, a fundamental concept of the status quo. Now, by the way, when I say exposition, I don't necessarily mean the entirety of the backstory. You can have a character who clearly is fucked up in some way that you have him in Act One. The viewer or the reader doesn't have to know the backstory for it. They just know there's something up with this guy. Eventually, somewhere toward the end of Act Two, or perhaps Act Three, when the character reaches a moment of grace, which is another thing that I'll get to, that is frequently when the backstory becomes told to the viewer. But this is where we're introducing everything. This is how things are at that particular moment in time. If you're thinking of it in movie terms, it's generally the first 10 to 15 minutes of the film. At the end of Act 1 comes the Act 1 turning point. This is the point where something happens that is going to give the viewer a clear idea of what this film is going to be about. It sets the rest of the story into motion. Let's go with an easy one. And sometimes the act, the act one turning point can come in several beats, okay? Several story points. But putting it simply, Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Rings, the first of the entire trilogy, what is the act one turning point of essentially the entire Lord of the Rings trilogy. There you go. The Council of Elrond. No worries. I will repeat it and it will be much louder. The, 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 the first beat of the Act One turning point is Gandalf realizing, wait a minute, this rings evil. Right? Because through the first Act turning point, we have met, for, through the first Act, we have met most of the major players. Right? Most, but not all. To the latter part of Act 1, we go to the Council of Elrond, where we meet all the rest of the major players. We meet the Dwarf, we meet the Elf, we meet pretty much all the big deal people. We meet all of them through the first act. Frodo stands up and says, I will return the ring. That's your Act 1 turning point. Now we know what this story is going to be about. He's got that has been laid out for. Him. He's got to go to Mount Doom, chuck the ring into fire. We know what his story arc is going to be, and we know what his character arc is going to be. There is, to my mind, nothing more important in a story than the character arc. The character arc is what your story is about. There's all kinds of story developments and all kinds of plots, but if you don't have your main character changing in some way, shape, or form in the course of the story. You don't have a story. What you do have is an anecdote. Okay. Jim Shooter likes to hold up as perfect storytelling Little Miss Muffet. Little Miss Muffet sat on a tuffet. Okay, there's your setup. Eating her curds and whey. You know what her status quo is. A long headed spider sat down beside her. Oh my god, it's the second act, it's the first act turning point and frighten this muffin away. Okay, no, that's not a story, that's an anecdote. It's a nice basic concept of how to launch a story, but there's no act two, and there's no act two turning point, and there's no third act. So, you know, sorry Jim, nice idea, doesn't actually work in execution. A character arc means that the character will be at a certain point in his life. It is what is called the mythic journey. A quintessential version of that, go read the books of uh, uh, yeah, Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell. William Campbell. No, that's not right. Joseph Campbell. Who will talk about the, the, the classic journey, which is farm boy, Luke Skywalker, Willow from the movie Willow, not Willow from, you know, uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Although there's some element of that too. The young farm boy is called to adventure. He goes through adventure, he winds up becoming fundamentally changed, and then returns to his village to bring his wisdom 
to the villagers and become a leader of the people. And that is the classic, in a nutshell, quintessential journey. Now, that's one way to do it, but essentially that must, that must be a consistent aspect of characterization. That the character is starting at point A, and he has, generally speaking, a certain moral center. He, had, he has a way that he looks at the world. He has a way that he views himself. There are certain things that he may want from life. There are certain things that he doesn't want from life. These are all things that you can develop. As he goes through Act 2, which we'll get to in a moment, the events in Act 2 will impact on him, causing him to question his preconceptions, and either he will deviate from them and do so in a positive manner, or he will deviate from them in a negative manner. It can go either way. So, through the course of Act 2, what happens in Act 2 is going to shape your character, and all of the events that happen in Act 2 should, in some way, shape, or form, challenge him. Now, usually, when you take a creative writing class, they will say, a story goes like this in terms of an escalating series of events, like a roller coaster, and then drops off at the end, and anything that happens from here is anticlimax. That's true as far as it goes, but it's simplistic. In fact, what a story should do is go off in a series of different directions. Right? It can fold back in on itself. It can go up, down, sideways. The story should actually be kind of an irregular journey. You can even go completely off topic and have a subplot, a separate series of events that have nothing to do with what's going on but they wind up intersecting at some point. And all of this should ideally come together. This is where the bulk of your story happens. This is where the majority of your character's challenges occur. At some point, in the course of the second act, generally toward the end, to the end of the second act, the character will have what's called his moment of grace. He will be forced to face the fundamental issue that has been driving him, or has been dogging him, or has been a big problem for him. Probably one of the great moments of grace is, how many people saw Officer and a Gentleman? Great. Okay. Um, oh, that was, that, was, that was the, God, I got to start getting the fight. Fight. What? The fight. No. In Officer and a Gentleman is about uh, Richard Gere plays a guy who wants to become a, a fighter pilot. And the whole film, much of the film, is him at head to head with Lou Gossett, who won an Oscar, I think, as the toughest, as the toughest nail sergeant. And there comes a point where he has found, and Lou Gossett's character has found out that Mayo, which is his character, which is the, the, the uh, Richard Gere character, has been cheating, has been, has been breaking the rules because he's been selling stolen stuff. And he wants him to resign, to DO, uh, uh, drop on request, DOR. And he says, I want your resignation. If they want you to DOR, drop on request. And Richard Gere's character says, I'm not going to do it. You can throw me out, but I'm not going to quit. And Lou Goss is going, oh, yeah. OK, we're going to do this. And they squawk. Everybody else is off doing their own thing because they have to leave. Gere's character is put through the ringer by Lou Goss's character, just put through the ringer. You know, um, and eventually he reaches this climactic point where he's yelling at him, saying, no, D-O-R, I ain't going to quit. And Gossett says, okay, fine, you're out. And Gossett's, and, and, and Richard Gere's character says, don't you do it, don't you? And he screams at him, I got nowhere else to go. I got nowhere, I got nothing else. And this is when he's forced to come to grips with the fact that he needs this that he really does have nowhere else to go. And it's a, an incredible moment for him as he comes to terms with this. And Gossett's character goes like, OK, Mayo, on your feet. And off, they, and, and, and off they go. And yeah, he's still scrubbing the trees, but he's still there. And from that moment of grace, he then grows to become the leader that he always had the potential to be. But first, he had to come to 
terms with the fact that he really had to go in for this, this new code of conduct that was going to make him over into another man. I will give you now, so I will give you another moment of grace that I think all of you are going to understand, or not understand, but be familiar with what you're saying. Much, much better. Who is the hero of Lord of the Rings? Who's the hero? Most people will say Frodo. But this gentleman here, right, said, who said Sam? You did. I thought you did. Okay, well, whatever. This gentleman said, Sam, there is a very serious argument to be made for that. Because, <clears throat> yes, Frodo meets the heroic standard of leaving his town, you know, putting back, putting behind him his peaceful world and embarking on a dangerous thing. But from the moment we go from the first act turning point, Frodo has established his mission. Frodo doesn't grow as a character. Instead, he deteriorates as the ring exerts more and more control on him. Sam, in the meantime, his whole thing, when he first starts out, at the first act turning point, all he wants to do is follow Mr. Frodo. I'm going to be at your side, that kind of thing, right? Although Frodo consistently deteriorates throughout the film and throughout the books, Sam grows as a character. So the moment of grace for Sam in Lord of the Rings, what do you guys think is the moment of grace for Sam? No, no, no. Now we kill now we kill the guy. No. This is Sam's moment of grace. When he says to Frodo, I may not be able to carry the ring, but I can carry you. And that is a line that has people cheering, right? And they don't know why they're cheering from a technical point. They don't understand the writing mechanics and dynamics of the technical point of from the technical. But what they do understand is that Sam, who has seen himself as basically the sidekick, the guy whose job it is to stick with Mr. Frodo, is now taking the lead. Frodo is down. Frodo is out. And Sam picks him up and is carrying, I'm sorry, like this, <laughs> is carrying Frodo up the mountain because Frodo is done. Frodo can't get it done. And Sam steps in to the hero role and gets it done. Now, sticking with, now, uh, so we're combining plot and, and characterization at the same time. We get to the, we get to the climactic second act. We now have several beats of the second act turning point. Because here's what the second act turning point does. The second act turning point has to accomplish two things. It has to raise the stakes of whatever it is that you're dealing with. And some sort of ticking clock has to be set into motion. Frequently in action adventure movies, there's a genuine ticking clock. <laughs> right? I mean, Goldfinger, they put on the bomb. Bond has to get to it, and, and uh, you know, the ticking clock is there. You must solve this problem. Within this period of time, or you are screwed, glued, and tattooed. Okay? Now, in Lord of the Rings, there are two ticking clocks set into motion. One, and because remember, we're again here to multiple storylines. So here, in the red storyline, we're following the journey of Sam and Frodo. Over here, we're dealing with pretty much the rest of the Mishpuchah. Okay? So Aragorn and the rest of the Mishpuchah say, we need to do something to draw attention away from Frodo. I know. Let's go stand in front of, of, of uh, Sauron's vast fortress and, and, you know, thaw our noses at it. That's a good idea. <laughs> right? You know, and, and Gimli's going like, no, no prayer. I'm all for it. You know, you've got to love having a dwarf. Which, by the way, I remember when I first found out 
And then John Reese Davies at a Dragon Con, he says, Oh, and I'm going to be a Lord of the Rings. He's going, Great, who are you playing? He's going, Gimli. He's going, What? Because Davies is like up here, going, Is he still a dwarf? Oh, yeah, special photography. I mean, like, yeah, like, it's like saying, like, Yes, I'll be wearing special shoes. <laughs> but okay. At any rate, so, now we've got Sam, we've got Frodo and Sam getting there. Now, their second act, their ticking clock has not yet been sent into motion. But the ticking clock of the rest, the rest of the Mishra Hop is, which by the way means family, in case you don't know. They arrive at Sauron's, at Sauron's, uh, you know, Bermuda hut. And they go meaner, and out comes, for people who have not seen, who people have seen the unedited version, I love that they sent out, that Sauron sent out the French taunter. Which I thought was hysterical. The mouth of Sauron, who's basically like the French taunter guy from Monty Python, the Holy Grail. It's great. And anyway, the gates open up, and now out comes Thorin, the second act turning point for the Mishpacha. Okay? Which is that they are now suddenly going to be surrounded. And if you look at it very carefully, there's actually a shot where they are literally surrounded like this. They're here, this little black dot. And they are surrounded by the forces of Sauron, like this. <laughs> and I went, oh my god, Sauron is CBS. Because <laughs> if you look at that one frame, it really is the CBS logo. I mean, you know, I don't know quite know what to make of that. I mean, it's also like it's supposed to be Sauron, so I thought it looks like CBS. So here's their second act turning point. They are openly defying Sauron. Okay. This is up the stakes because they're going to be wiped out. And it has set a ticking clock into motion because if Frodo does not get his shit together and throw this thing in the fire, Sauron, Sauron is going to wipe the floor with these guys because they're outnumbered 120. Okay? So this drives us into our third act because the second act turning point of Sam and Frodo what is the moment that suddenly sets the ticking clock into motion and up the stakes in their story? What is the moment? Anyone? God, you like Anyone? Anyone? You look? No. What? Not Gollum coming after them, all of that's about. But he's been there the whole time. You can't up the stakes by saying, and Gollum's back! Frodo's ready to drop the ring. Frodo is ready to drop the ring, but what happens? What does Frodo say to Sam? The ring is mine. That ups the stakes. All of a sudden, oh, holy Christ on a crutch, Frodo has been completely taken over by the ring. Now, the stakes are through the roof because Frodo is going to try and hold on to the ring, which is not going to be able to happen because the Dark Riders are going, hey, holy crap, there's something going on in Mount Doom. And they whip, you actually see them. They whip around in midair because the moment that, that Frodo puts on the rings, this is, a, this is like a cowbell to, to the riders who suddenly go, whoa, so now the, the riders are coming. You know they're going to find Frodo's ass, invisible ring or not. So the stakes have now, so so now escalated because Sauron has a much better chance of getting the ring. And the time has been set in motion because here come the dark riders coming right after him. This all drives us to the third act where everything comes together. Okay, it all comes together. And the ring gets thrown in. God, and i got to tell you, the thing is that when you think about it, Frodo is a failed hero. And I will get back to that and the ramifications of that. If the ring gets thrown in, courtesy of Gollum. This simultaneously solves not only Frodo's problem, because the quest has been resolved, but it also solves the, these guys' problem over here because all of a sudden when Sauron's tower falls, everyone, oddly enough, they don't go, they've destroyed, they've destroyed Lord Sauron, let's get them out of revenge, which you think <laughs> would be the logical response. Instead, outnumbered 100 to 1, the bad guys throw away their advantage and split. <laughs> go figure. Now, Here's the thing. Everything that happens after the climax, which is what this is, is by definition the anticlimax. Anticlimax.
tax, generally speaking, is not good. Probably the film that, that have made the best use, or I should say films, of minimizing anticlimax was the Karate Kid. Okay? Because in the original one and in the remake, it both ends within 45 seconds of either Jaden Smith or Ralph Macchio, Ralph Macchio, no, Ralph Macchio's here, Ralph Macchio, kicking the bad guy in the face, or not the bad guy, the, the evil kid, in the face, he goes down, he wins, hey, Mr. Miyagi, hey, Mr. Hong, I won, right? Fade to black to the end. In both films, there were entire sequences that were filmed after that that they wound up not using. In the original Karate Kid, there's a whole sequence in there where, um, where, where Mr. Miyagi faces off against the opposing, the opposing karate teacher, which they wound up using in the beginning of Karate Kid 2, which is why Ralph Macchio ages two years from the first scene of Karate Kid 2 to the second scene of Karate Kid 2. Um, in, the, um, in the second Karate Kid, they had a five minute battle between Jackie Chan and the bad guy, which personally, screw it, I think they should have kept in. How do you leave a Jackie Chan, five minute Jackie Chan fight <laughs> on the cutting room floor? Well, okay, they put it to the DVD entries, but still, it's a five minute Jackie Chan fight. Yeah, I'll leave it in. But, go for it. At any rate, you know, movie was a success, so what do I know? At any rate, Lord of the Rings, on the other hand, went on for another half hour. So if you sat there during the last half hour of Lord of the Rings, looking at your watch five times more than you did in the course of the entire previous three movies, this is why. But it goes, it's an interesting observation, interesting lesson, in the notion of the failed hero. Because if the hero succeeds, according to the mythic journey, he returns to town, imparts his knowledge and wisdom, and becomes a town leader. Does any of that happen with Frodo? No. He does return home, but he doesn't stay. He's going, you know, this place isn't for me. Why is it not for him? Because he's always going to be, he's always going to know in his heart that he didn't get the job done, that he was a failure. Who becomes the mayor of the town and has the wife and the kids? Sin. So as I said, the argument can easily be made that although Frodo is the protagonist, Sam is the hero. But you do need those changes. The only series of films that I can think of where that is not a requirement is James Bond. Okay? James, Casino Royale aside, James Bond doesn't change. From one film to the next to the next to the next, he's James Bond. Why does he not change? He doesn't have to. He's James Bond. How can you do better than being James Bond? You, but, but, there are still, there are still a character arc in a James Bond film. It's always the same one. There's a woman who cannot stand James Bond when we are introduced to her, and by the end of the film, she loves James Bond. So there is some change. <laughs> it's the same one. But people always say the Bond girl is necessary. Yes, the Bond girl is necessary because she's the only one in the Dan film who has an actual character arc. So we actually get to watch a change. Because Bond, we watch for the gadgets and the suaveness. And by the way, I want to say, I think Pierce Brosnan looks better in a tuxedo than any other man on the face of the planet. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll fight him. But yeah, you were about to do that. He's a, James Bond's a good example. Isn't that more like comic book storytelling? You talk about the character arcs, but a lot of these times, if you are really going to come, you're using established characters yes. for 20, 30 years. Yeah. So you're not going to really do major changes. That's well. That's where we get into something that Stan Lee, I thought, summed up very, very nicely, which is that yes, you're absolutely right. When you're doing characters who are long term and are company owned, you're not going to do a lot of changes because fundamentally they have to remain the same. Um, and if you do a lot of changes to them, then you have to bring in Mephisto, which nobody wants to have. Do you want to need a break, by the way? What? I'm, I'm good, are you guys good? Should I keep going? Or?
Yeah. Okay. All right, then take it if you can. I can use another bottle of water. Uh, it's on the way. Yeah. What? Well, holy shit! All right. <laughs> um, I'm just getting warmed up. <laughs> and if you can we make the air conditioning actually even, even, even more? Let's really drive for people who are watching the video tape. Okay. Stan Lee perfected what he referred to as the illusion of change. That he would have things happen to Spider-Man, to the Fantastic Four, that made it seem as if there were changes occurring. But all of those changes were fundamentally cosmetic. Peter Parker, at least under Stan's reign, still remained the same insecure, trouble-ridden schlub that he was when he first started out. Yes, eventually he got, he went to college, but he was a trouble-ridden schlub in college. Yes, he got a motorcycle in his brief flirtation with being cool, but what he was was a trouble-ridden schlub who got a motorcycle so that he would look cool. Just like when I was 13 or 14 or 15, I started taking up guitar so that I would look cool. And I would walk around with this guitar with a strap across my chest, and it would be anchored on either side. And the problem was, was that I never left enough room in the door to allow for the extension. So anytime I would go through any kind of a narrow <laughs> door, the guitar would hit the sides of the door, come loose from the strap, and fall to the ground. So I could generally be heard coming into a room from the combination of clump, crash, bang. You know, I did not look cool. I wasn't cool with a guitar. Peter Parker had a, had a motorcycle. He, even when he had a gorgeous redhead on the back of the motorcycle, he was still an uncertain schlub. And this happens in real life. Okay? Some years ago, Billy Crystal hosted the Academy Awards, well, he, he hosted it a bunch of times, but the one that is unarguably the best was the one where Jack Palance dropped and did 10 one-handed push-ups. Crystal killed that He Killed. I mean, the stuff he had ready already was funny as hell, but once Jack Palance did that, it was it. He had Hollywood in the palm of his hand. Hollywood's finest, the most elite, were rolling in the aisles from every word that came out of Billy Crystal. You know what Billy Crystal did whenever he was backstage? He would run up to gaffers, grips, the guys who were handling the craft services table for all the food, and he would walk up to these guys who like, could work all their lives and not make in their entire life what Billy Crystal makes in one movie. And he would go up to them and say, how am I doing? Right? Jack Nicholson is laughing his ass off in the front row, and he's asking the craft services guy, how he's doing. Is it good? Do you think I'm working? Do you think it's working? Do you think it's going over well? And it wasn't because he was being kind of like, you know, a dilettante. He really needed to know. Why? Because despite the fact that he was Billy Crystal catering to Hollywood's greatest, inside he was still the nervous little Jewish kid who wanted to make sure that he was really liked. I mean, a lot of people made fun of Sally Field when she said, you like me, you really like me. But she was just being honest. There is this fundamental insecurity in people like that. And they need the approval. Actors get on applause for a reason. Same thing with Peter Parker. No matter what he did, Stan made damn sure that he was still the same nervous, insecure, trouble-ridden schmuck who was always going to feel guilty no matter how many people he saved because of the one God who died because of him. And don't, I gotta tell you, don't underestimate, because it's been so many years, don't underestimate the power of Spider-Man's origin, okay? Because I took my 11-year-old daughter to see, at the time, to see Spider-Man. And she's watching it, there's Cliff Roberts, and he's doing his thing now. And he gets shot, and he's lying there dying, and Tobey Maguire's freaking out. And I suddenly hear sobbing. And I look, and, and my daughter has tears pouring down her face. And she's going, is he going to die? But he's so, that's so sad. And, and oh my god, that's so sad. Why is he dying? And I'm going, my god, she doesn't know. And I realized I'd never read her in the origin. She knew Spider-Man. Everyone knows Spider-Man. Three-year-old kids with spider
Spider-Man light-up sneakers. And Trish knows Spider-Man, but they don't know the story. And Spider-Man goes swinging after the guy, Tobey Maguire does, and he catches up with him, and he turns, and, oh, my, holy God, it's this guy. And, uh, and my daughter, Otter, is going, oh, my God. <laughs> Uncle Ben is dead because of Peter. And I'm going, yeah, and she was stunned. She was absolutely stunned. And if you go do a Google search on with great power comes great responsibility, you're going to get like 1.8 million hits. And what's interesting is that nobody in Amazing Fantasy number 15 actually says that. The narrator says that. The narrator says, and so young Peter has learned that with great power comes great responsibility. The end of our 11 page story that will probably vanish into the annals of history, never to be seen again. Which I know, I don't know. Um, you never know, right? Because, and that, that, you know, and that line was again Spider Man's moment of grace. The moment that he realizes with great power comes great responsibility. But the problem is that in a nice subversion, of characterization. He learns this too late. He learns it too late for that particular story. But then it informs him for the ongoing series which Stan didn't know was going to happen. He just thought it was having a downbeat, kind of like, you know, Aesop's stable, but really depressing and on a superhero level. Now, um, let's go through something. Specific. Oh, so we. So we've got a basic handle on plot, right? I was going to go through how it applies to aliens and that kind of thing, but I don't think we need to do that at this point. Let's talk about some more comic specific stuff. First off, pure fundamental technical stuff. When you're writing a comic book, the most important thing is to think visually. Because you can do stories with two people standing around talking. You absolutely can. But you have to come up with a way to make it visually interesting. And that's, a, that's one of the big differences between writing comic books and writing novels. If you're writing a novel, you can write a five, six, seven page scene. That's nothing but two people talking. If you're writing a play, for that matter, you can do that also. As long as the dialogue is and the characterization is compelling and the, and the people are invested in it, you're going to be able to hold their interest. In comic books, you're damn well going to have to make sure that you're either telling it visually or that you have a crackerjack artist to do it. And a lot of artists are incapable of doing it. I mean, I wrote a, a Batman story. It's a 20 case story. The notion was fairly simple. Commissioner Gordon's wife had been kidnapped by the penguin. And I don't even remember why. And he had her in a death trap somewhere in Gotham City. The death trap is going to spring at midnight. Why do we know this? Because the penguin told us. The penguin said so. And with, it's only a 20 page story, so that had to be an accepted part of the story. Commissioner, they've captured the penguin. Batman is not answering the bad signal. Gordon's wife is in this trap, and they've got 22, and Gordon has 22 minutes to break the pain. Now, when I wrote the script, I wish I had a copy of it, it was, I did every trick that I could to make it visually compelling. But, it still came down to that it was a 20 page story, 18 pages of which was two guys in a single we had real trouble getting an artist for it. The editor loved it. Couldn't find an artist. Finally, P. Craig Russell and Michael Gilbert took it on and they knocked it out of the freaking park. But it was a real challenge for the artist. There was an issue of Supergirl that essentially they called it My Dinner with Buzz, in which this demonic character being Buzz, <clears throat> who I will simply say in shorthand, was kind of like Spike from Buffy, except Buzz came out two years before Spike came out. So, you know, technically Spike was like Buzz. But at any rate, he shows up at Linda Danvers' house. Um, 
He's been invited for dinner by Linda's mother, who doesn't know who or what he is. So you've got Buzz, Linda, and the parents, and Buzz and Linda really know what's going on. And the parents don't. Most of the story took place around the dinner table. I would never have written that story with a majority of the artists who I worked with. I do not believe they could have carried it off. This was by Leonard Kirk. Leonard Kirk is a master storyteller. Leonard can do anything. Okay, now it's too cold. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, because I understand I'm like right under the well, I'm the one that's getting lots of you all on it. At any rate, so I was sure that Leonard could carry it off. But I, oh, that's perfect. Um, but it's not something that I do very often. So you have to be really, really careful that if you're telling a story in which there's essentially no action, you want to try and make it as visual as possible. Now, when you're now there are two fundamental ways to write scripts, generally speaking. Unlike movies, in which there is one standard format for screenplay writing, there are two ways of writing scripts for comedy. One is what is called the Marvel Way. So named because in the old days, Stan Lee, who was writing like 10 books at one time, simply didn't have the time to write detailed scripts. So Jack Kirby would come into the office, and Stan would say, all right, Jack, in this, and it's really kind of easy to do Stan Lee, which is kind of like, a, uh, it, it, it's kind of like, like a cross between the Mr. Rogers and, and, and all in. Oh, we're going to say, here's what you, that's going to happen. We're going to have Dr. Doom come back. And he's going to take over the Baxter building. And aided only by Daredevil, they will penetrate the Baxter building and defeat Dr. Doom. What do you think, Jack? And Jack would be trotting down those, and Jack would go, OK. And off Jack would go, and a month later, or three weeks later, Jack walks in with 22 pages of story. Which Stan would then, and the thing is that Jack would do liner notes of the dialogue, which were generally pretty ghastly, which you can generally discern by going and reading the, the, the Fourth World books that he did for, um, for DC, because that was unexplicated Jack Kirby dialogue, which was kind of demented. It had a huge charm in its own way, and just purely as a sidetrack. There was one time where, when I was writing Aquaman, I decided to guest star some Jack Kirby villains called the Deep Six. Love the names, right? And I initially, I started dialoguing the Deep Six in my own style. And then I went, they don't seem right in my head. And I stepped back, and I thought, not literally stepped back, and I went, I have to write them like Kirby. If I don't write them like Kirby, they don't sound right to me. So I wrote Deep Six like Kirby. I put in random quotation marks <laughs> and put in accents in strange places, boldface, for no reason. So the Deep Six would say, so, Aquaman, what do you think you're doing here? You know, and that's what it read like. And it was demented. But the characters sounded right. And there were some people who wrote in very angrily and said, Peter David is making fun of Jack Kirby. <laughs> no, I wasn't. It was just the only way the characters sounded right in my head. At any rate, um, okay, totally lost track of what I was talking What? Marvel, I think. See? Okay, he's on it. Gold star. Yes. Uh, I do have one question. Sure. When you're talking about the conversation scene, Yes. The, you know, for Supergirl. Right. Um, can you give us a little bit of an illustration as to how, you, like you said, write it visually, but what were some of the things that you gave the artist to do to break up? I will, an, I will answer that as I'm describing script setups. Okay. okay. So at any rate, this, uh, this uh, interaction between Stan and Jack and Stan and Steve Ditko and Stan and pretty much any other Marvel artist at the time, resulted in what was called the Marvel Method, which was that the story is described in broad strokes, the, art, the artist does all the pacing and all the storytelling, and then it goes back to the writer, who then writes the script, the actual dialogue. 
Now, in the old days, it was standing, you would just sit there and you would talk it out. What this became at Marvel eventually was the notion that um, the writer would write the plot in broad strokes. He made the pages one to five, this is what happens. Pages six to nine, this is what happens. And you describe it very broadly. And the artist that makes all the decisions in terms of the story, the pacing, um, what, where everything is going to go. Um, and I stopped doing this, and I used to write that way, and I stopped doing it for a couple of reasons. First off, because I realized that, for me, it was lazy. I was putting so much in there and then leaving to the artist to figure out how to sort it out. And that really isn't fair to the artist. To say nothing of the fact that it's then, uh, there was one time I was going to be doing a crossover from Iron Man um, in the issue of the home. And I looked at the story from the previous issue of Iron Man, the script, so I could get up to speed. And I was kind of appalled because the, the script was two pages long. It said pages one to three, summary of what went on before, pages four to six, some exposition, you know, more or less. And then, what the, and, then, and then what the writer put was pages 5 to 19. A big fight. Knock yourself out. <laughs> I'm going, where? The, and it kind of made me go, I sort of understand why the image guys thought that writers aren't important. Because if they're getting lots of scripts like this, I sure wouldn't think the writer's important. When I would write Marvel stuff, even when I was writing Marvel stuff, not only did I put in most of the dialogue at the story, at the story basis, but I would also choreograph the fights because I felt that the way that people fight comes out of their character. Spider-Man is not going to fight the same way as Captain America. Captain America is not going to fight the same way as Wolverine. Their moves, everything about them comes from character. And if you as the writer are not giving that to the artist, you're not doing your job. Um, also, it was I found that it was necessary to do expressions and put things in. The more detail you can give the artist in terms of setting things up, helicopter shots notwithstanding, the better off you're going to be. So I did not say, you know, Rick Jones and Bruce Banner discuss exposition for a page. I would write, Rick Jones leans against the fireplace hearth looking with utter incredulity at Bruce Banner. You've got to be kidding me, says Rick. So, in the former version, the artist is just going to have Rick going, right? In my version, he's going to have him going, <laughs> and that's going to convey on the page. It's going to give you more depth of character. It's going to give you more to work with. The other way is via what's called full scripting. And that's what I do now, because it's, it forces me to think about what's going to be able to be on the page. It forces me not to just dump everything on the artist and make it all his problem. Now, let, okay, so this is, okay, we'll go get it. Now, when you're talking about trying to make something as visual as possible, there are ways to do this, the best way is to quite simply think about where you're placing your camera, what angle you're approaching, what people are doing in particular thing, in, you know, in particular sequences, panel composition. Is, is it coming in from the side? Are you angled from above? Are you looking up? You know, are you doing a far shot where, where something is going past and is positioned from the point of view of a bird looking down? How can you move things around? What little things? can you do in order, so when you have people sitting at dinner, right, you can have, uh, you can have the salt shape, you can have implements, you can have little things like um, where, uh, where Buzz is not, where Buzz is talking, and as he's talking, he knocks over a salt shaker, right? Um, and uh, he continues to talk, and he just picks it up, and he does like, throw salt over his shoulder, because he wouldn't want anything bad to happen. Right? And in the meantime, he's doing that exposition, or he's doing the character interaction. In a, in, there's all, you always have to think visually. In West Wing, they would have extended pages of dialogue. 
How did they make it visually interesting? They did walk and talks. It became a signature part of West Wing. They're always having these lengthy meetings, lots of meetings, but all you're going to, you don't want to just have meeting after meeting after meeting in a room. So instead, they just have meetings in the hallway, and they're moving through stuff as they're doing it. As a matter of fact, they even made a joke about it in an early, in one episode where they flash back to when they first arrived in the, uh, in the West Wing, and two of the characters are talking, and they're saying, they're looking for the offices because they don't know where anything is. And one of them says, we should just have meetings in the hallway. <laughs> Which is what they effectively do. Who watches Game of Thrones? Okay, they have lengthy scenes of exposition, countless scenes of exposition. How do they get around, how do they make that visual in Game of Thrones? Easy! Naked women! <laughs> this is when people say, why is there so much nudity in Game of Thrones? Why? Because the scenes would be fucking boring. If you didn't have naked women, and sometimes for the female viewers, naked guys. And every time you see a scene in Game of Thrones, and when the next season starts up, and you see people naked in the scene, mentally, and I know it's, I know it's counterintuitive, <laughs> guys, certainly, mentally, put clothes on the women, and think what that scene would be like if there was not naked people in the thing, because I think you will find they'd be pretty dull. But since there's naked people in there, you don't notice. You're lucky if they're paying attention to what they're saying. You know, so it's actually, it's actually pretty clever. Um, so if you're, now, in a comic book, in a Marvel or DC book, the naked thing, you really can't get away with it that much. But you want to have them doing interesting things. So in X Factor, for example, I will have several people in the kitchen talking. And the stuff that they're talking about, I like to think is interesting enough. But in the meantime, I'll have them eating ice cream, or cleaning something up, or doing other things, little things that are visual. Some sort of movement in the panel that will draw the eye so that you're just not happy with them. Even when you have people sitting around a dinner table, you can still have people getting up, sitting down, serving things, rearranging things. There's lots of business that can be done. Now, when you're composing a panel, one of the things that you have to be careful of is putting too many things into a panel. You can't, and, and I've seen this from a lot of young writers, who they will put stuff into a panel that the artist cannot possibly, possibly accomplish. So you'll get a, you'll, you'll a, a Spider-Man script from a novice writer, and he'll say something like, you know, panel A, Spider-Man leaps in through, leaps in through the window, spins, turns, punches out one villain, turns another way, punches out the other villain while knitting a sweater. Now, you can do this a little bit. Right? You can have, you can convey Spider-Man with multiple images. But then you go right off the rail with panel B. In runs the villain with three of his lackeys who start shooting and running forward at the same time. How are you going to convey that? You know, he starts shooting, he's running forward. There's too many elements. When you are composing a scene, when you're composing a panel, you want to have one action per scene, per, per panel. One action, like a moment frozen in time, because that's what it is. There, there was an early Spider-Man, where Spider-Man is somersaulting through the air. Okay, so Steve Ditko draws Spider-Man in a somersault, right? So he's basically poked, he's frozen in the air, and he's in the middle of the somersault. Stan then gives him three balloons worth of dialogue. Now, picture that in your head for a moment. Spider-Man is somersaulting in the air, and he's speaking three word balloons worth of dialogue. If you could, in real life, get out one or two words while you're somersaulting, that's pretty amazing. Spider-Man, which is the amazing Spider-Man. <laughs> so Spider-Man in the real world would literally have to be going like this in mid-air, like a perpetual motion machine. And believe me, in the Marvel Universe, we have characters who could do that. I mean, Monet could do that easy. Right? 
but not Spider-Man. But in their list, there's Spider-Man spinning in the air like this while saying all of this dialogue. What you are trying to capture in a frame, in a panel, is the seconds before and the seconds after and the second in the middle and put it all together nicely with one image. And you've got some latitude. Now the thing is, as comic books become more and more and more movie-oriented or influenced by movies, you see this happening less and less. More often than not, you see a lot, which and people ask why comic books are becoming longer, why the stories seem padded. It's because it's what I talked to you about before, about the Silver Age, you know, with Superman, right? Where you could put into a pat into a caption five panels worth of material and it's in one panel. So nowadays they will have a, a, a panel where one character stands there and goes, huh? <laughs> You wouldn't see that in a Gardner Fox or George Schwartz edited <laughs> story. Just one character going, huh? And then someone goes, I'm serious. Panel three. Really? Panel four. Yes. <laughs> well, there it is. There's a whole page. Done. <laughs> On to the next page. It becomes a little bit ridiculous. So you can write that way. And it is really very much the more current way to do it. But keep in mind that your panel really can cover a period of time. Okay, so you do have that latitude. The seconds before, the seconds after. But one thing at a time, please. In terms of dialoguing, I try to, and now there's lots, you know, first of all, it's going to depend upon the size of the panel. Okay? Generally speaking, you don't really want more than 20, 30 words in a panel. Danny, does that seem about right? That's about right. You want that? There used to be, used to be in the old days, there was a 35 word uh, 35 word rule for that was. But also keep in mind that you have to be aware of how big your panel is. And who your letterer is. And what? And who your letterer is. And who your letterer is. If you want to, I mean, nowadays, if you want to do a panel that's got 50 words in it, knock yourself out. But it better be a damn big panel. Because then you have so that if you're going to do a page, oh there it is. If you're going to do a page where the basic panel layout, goodbye, story arts, goodbye, CDS. If you're going to do a panel, well, a page, where it's going to essentially be grid like that, which is basically watchmen. Because when you look at Watchmen, the whole thing is laid out in exactly this grid. You can do 20 words here, 20 words here, 20 words here, 20, you know, 20 30 words all the way through. But let's say, let's say that you want to do a panel where there's going to be 50 or 60 words, because it's going to be a really good major speech. OK, that's fine. But this better be the panel size. So you're going to have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then Here's where you're going to have your 50 words. The panels can also be used in terms of size and shape to convey the emotionality of the moment, which is why it bugs me when people sometimes put in full panels for no reason. And this was a particularly big problem in the 90s. And the reason this was really irritating and the reason that artists really loved putting in gigantic splash page panels was because the big splash page panels got more money in the art resale secondary market. So that when they would get back their pay, because people wanted to pay more for big splash pages than they wanted to do with pages that had like four, five, or six panels. And boy, artists are going to be pissed off with me when they do that. But you know what? That's the way it was in the 90s, so deal with it. It's less so now, which is good. But with why, for instance, it always broke me up. In an issue of respect, <coughs> I had the characters of Richter and Shatterstar become reunited. Now, for 20 years, Richter and Shatterstar, two male heroes, had had a nudge, nudge, wink, wink, their really gay subtext relationship. And then Shatterstar disappeared for a while, and then he came back. And of course, I decided to bring him back to be a, to, to get involved with Richter. And when I had Shatterstar show up, I thought, you know what? Screw it. This is the 21st century. Why, you know, why are we messing around? We don't have to do nudge, nudge, wink, wink. And when, when, Sh 
Shatterstar shows up, he goes, Richter, and the two of them come together and they kiss. This was such, to me, a massive emotional moment that of a Uh, it's terrible. But it was a five-page panel. In the five, it was a five-panel page. Richter and Shatterstar kiss on panel five of the six-panel page, which conveyed to my mind, to the audience, I didn't really think it was that big a deal. You know, two guys kiss. It's the 21st century. That's the way that goes. You know, it's not a big shocking thing. Which broke me up because. Fans, some fans accuse me of sensationalizing it. No, if I was sensationalizing it, and here's how to sensationalize it, instead, Richard and Shatterstar come to, you know, show up, Richard and Shatterstar. And in the sixth panel of what would be the last page of the book, you see their lips coming toward each other. <laughs> oh my God, are they going to kiss? Then, next issue, Giant splash page in which they shake hands or whatever, right? But no, panel five was six panel page. That's how much. That's how sensationalistic I thought it was. Now let me uh, let me go over this and give you some practical. Oh, one other thing. People ask about this balloon placement. A very popular topic. Well, come on, comic book fans, you know, wrestlers, let's give it to anybody. Balloon placement. There are different formulas and different styles from various kinds of companies. Marvel's general style, and what I think is the better way to go, is whenever possible, anchor the balloon. Anchor it either to the panel itself, the panel border itself, or if you're going to have another, if you're going to have another balloon, if you're continuing it extend from the previous one by drawing it up. Then if you're going to have somebody else reply, have it over there. Try to anchor it whenever possible to the panel board. I just happen to think it looks a little tiny. When you're working with an artist, the artist, if he's professional, will leave you space at the top of the panel to accommodate balloon placement. You're not always going to be able to get everything in there. So when you are, sometimes you're going to have to cover the characters themselves or parts of the character. Try to stay away from their face. <laughs> A quintessential moment in fucked up balloon placement is all the way back to, you know what I'm going to say, X-Men number one, in which Stan decided that Magneto had a lot to say. So if you look back at that issue of X-Men number one, I would, see this is why I wish now I really had work out. Come on, um, Magneto is talking, and you see like the top of Magneto's helmet, and here's his feet. <laughs> see, this is why I never make fun of Rob Liefeld's feet, because that's something even worse. And here's Magneto's feet, and the rest of him is <laughs> below. <laughs> what would have to imagine there was an instruction to move the yard that we could never got done? Yeah. You're generous in thinking Thanks. so. Oh, actually, let's see if I have that one in here. This, by the way, is my book, Writing for Comics and Graphic Novels with Peter David. One of the, now, the previous edition of this had my name this big. It's the only book of mine that's ever come out that had my name big enough on the cover for even my father. <laughs> I want to see, um, want to see if I have that. Where did one get that book, Peter? What? Where well, we'll tell you. Uh, here, Danny, could you look for and see if you can find my metal thing? I, may, I think I may actually have it in there. Now, try to have the balloon pointer, whenever possible, coming out of. Here's the character. Hello, character. The ideal place for the balloon pointer, quite obviously, near the head. That's where he's talking. If you cannot have it near the head for some reason, at least somewhere close to the upper body. I really don't like talking hands. It's just, it's a thing. And so if, for example, you have a character speaking, and most of him, let's say that you have a shot, let's say it's Dark Tower, 
Okay? Here you've got Roland the gunslinger. He's pointing a gun at a bad guy, right? The bad guy's over here going, ah, I'm shooting. And there's Roland. I try not to have the balloon coming out of his hand. Because if, if nothing else gives talk to the hand of holding it. I sure as shit don't want to have the balloon coming out of his gun. I mean, you can say, you know, he lets his guns do speaking, but having it too literal is kind of ridiculous. Instead, breaking the anchoring policy, if you have to, although ideally, you stay to it, you put the balloon up here and have the balloon go off panel to where his head is. I'm not really big on talking body parts. Here it is. You found it? Yeah. Here, hold on. Here, pass, pass that around. Wait, wait, wait. You found it? Yeah, pass that around. So people will be chuckling around this. You see it there? Is that hysterical? Now, I have actually seen this in comic books, not published by Marvel or DC, thank God, but talking crotches is an absolute. I will accept talking body parts if absolutely necessary. Talking crotches is a drop dead. No starter, unless your story is about a guy with a talking crotch. <laughs> then go for it. And there have been, I think there have been whole movies about guys with talking crotches. Right? Am I right? I think so. Isn't that the present? Now that's basic in terms of panels, that kind of thing. Let me give you some of these, which we will go over. Now this is from, I, I want you to, the reason I want you to see this is because I want you to have an idea of how I set up a sequence. Now I'm, I'm, I'm going to read through it with you and I don't, I don't have enough for everybody, so, which I thought I was going to because I was told 50 people coming, apparently it's more than 20. I'm going to go through it with you so that you can see because I've essentially got three people in a car, right? Now, I have been talking for several pages. Well, how do you make that visual, you ask? Also, how, with three people in a car, in a, co in a superhero comic book, do you manage to have them display their superpowers? Because since this is, did you get uh, some back there? Because I know I uh, what? Really? They made it back here. Oh no, it's coming. It's still on its way. Anyone who can share up is good, because like I said, I really did have enough. Okay? But I also will be reading it. Okay. You guys mind staying late? Okay. So, and this is something else I'll show you later. When you're doing a superhero comic book, you want to try and convey the superpowers whenever possible in a casual way, somehow, some way, in some overt way sometimes. So here I am, now this is from an upcoming issue of x Men. We've got three characters, we've got Rain, we've got Polaris, and we've got Banshee, okay, or, uh, or Teresa Lorna and, well, Rain. And Rain has been in a huge funk. She's a Dallas Scots under the best of circumstances. But because of traumas that occurred to her, which I will not go into for detail, simply because they're not necessary for this. Yeah. Sorry, only because you just brought it up. One thing I've always been curious: How do you? I mean, do you like you said she's a Scotsman or Scotsman? Do you do accents? What? Do you, when you write, not all of them, but I try, particularly with Scots, I try to convey right. How do you an accent? Well, you're going to see. Okay. See, and aren't you glad you asked? So. She's been in such a funk that Polaris and Banshee have decided that the only way to solve this is via a road trip. Okay? So we've got the three of them in a car. Now, like I said, not particularly visual. We've got three superpowered women. How are they going, how, I ask myself as the writer, am I going to have them employ their superpowers, talk about what has to be talked about, and still have it be visually interesting? Let us go through this. And you can also have an idea of, also, I should mention, Google Images, writer's best friend. Absolutely.
Absolutely, because if you have an idea of what you want, you can go find out Google Images and put up a link and say to the artist, this is what I'm thinking of. Okay? Now, the artist's best friend also, I'm not endorsing theft by any means, but it gives you an idea of a starting point. Okay? Panel A, a, ca a country highway, one lane in either direction. An open top convertible is rolling along. Polaris is driving. Teresa is riding shotgun. Rain is in the back. Daytime. Notice that I established time of day. Also be aware that you can do lots of things with environment. Rain. Now, rain's a glare. You can have rain. You can have fog. Just, you know, we don't always just take for granted that the world's just always going to be a sunny day. Weather can do a wonderful bit of it for environment. It can totally change the entire feel for what the page is going to be. For instance, I did an issue of X Factor in which I said, panel A, establishing shop of X Factor headquarters. It is a cold, dreary day. There are no, there's nobody else about except maybe one guy walking along with his pocket, with his hands deep in his pockets, his head huddled like that. So this presents a very, this presents a mood, right? This is what the artist draw, drew. No fog, no daytime, sunny day, people walking past like it's a street fair, including one woman pushing a carriage with a baby holding a red balloon. Not the mood I was looking for. You know, so you try to describe as best you can and pray your artist gives you what you want. Polaris is driving, Teresa is riding shotgun, the radius in the back, daytime. The road should basically look like this, and you can take these home and you can look at what it looks like. Um, the running along a mountain ridge. Rain. Now, here you ask about Scots. I didn't understand. What is this mission we're going on? Now, a little Scots goes a long way, I should say. It just conveys the character's general style, but you don't have to go overboard. Teresa says, hush, hush, top secret. Very much needs to know. Polaris, just work, just relax, Rain. I'm keeping the top down so you can, you know, stick your head out. Rain slumps down in the back. Oh, keep in mind, for those who don't know, Rain is basically able to transform herself into a wolf. Okay? Rain slumps down in the back, her arms folded, looking annoyed. Rain, like a dog with my tongue dangling. Ha ha, very funny, I get it. And they say, oh, come on, Rain, it was a joke. You didn't used to be this sometime. Now, notice that I do not indicate in that panel who is speaking. Is it Rain, or is it Teresa, or is it Polaris? In point of fact, it doesn't matter. Not for this particular exchange. If it did matter, I would have had, the let's say that I had to convey that it was Teresa. So if I wanted to convey that, which was going to be off panel, I would say, you didn't used to be this uptight, right? Right, Lorna? Right, so that that way you know that it's Teresa. In this case, I think it was necessary. Yeah. I guess you also got to be aware of your On occasion, yes. Sometimes you'll have characters who have their own unique fonts. So let's say that it was a road trip with Death and Morpheus, right? With, with Desire sitting in the back. If it's going to be an off-panel thing and it's Morpheus speaking, you damn well better make sure that it's a black balloon with white printing on it. In which case, you just say, Morpheus off-panel. Yeah. That's an annoying editor's question. Sure. Yes, and no, I don't mind if I do. Yeah. If you have the balloon, then you say it doesn't matter who's speaking. In this, no, no, I say, no, no, no. This is even yeah. in this. Right. Doesn't it give the reader a moment to go who's speaking, and I'm out of the story for a second? Not, in, I didn't feel that would be in this case because I felt that it would be more trouble. I wanted the panel to be focused on ring, so the other response was going to have to come from off panel, and I felt that it was going to be more trouble than it was worth to indicate who was talking. In the, the dial, I could have done it, but it would have seemed, to my ear, contrived. So that's why, in this case, I felt that the reader was not going to come to a halt and say, wait, who said that? Because it's not really germane, especially since we go right to the next panel. Yeah? Uh, why are they numbered? What? Oh, good question. The gentleman asks, why are they numbered? Because when I dialogue, When I dialogue the page, right? So here's the panel, here are the people who are speaking, right? So we've got Ray, we've got Teresa, and we've got Ray, okay? 
what happens is, when you're putting in the dialogue balloon, that way, when the letterer then gets the script, the letterer says, oh, and he knows the corresponding balloon in which you put it. Very good question. I mean, there's so many things I take for granted that, you know, it, it, I'm glad you guys are asking. So that's why it's put in, so that when you do the balloon placement, it will make it that much easier. But that is why, I'll get right to you, that is why I letter the panels and number the dial. Some people will put numbers on the panel. And I think that's confusing, because you have one, and then you have one, two, and then you have two, and you have three, four, five, and I feel that that's confusing. So I letter the panel, since I'm reasonably sure that I'm not going to go through all the letters of the alphabet on a single page. And if I did, we got a whole other set of issues. Yeah? Um, I see this a lot of sort of as an artist type, we're having a hard time dealing with it. Shoot, what? Um, it just seems like on the panel A, that that should be a wide out shot, okay. and not a far in shot. And okay. then I need to show the dialogue and that was more intimate. Because in my mind, that should be too bad. Well, I'll tell you something. What I always say to the artists, and the artists always understand that, is that if they have a visually more compelling way to tell the story, to tell you know, the sequence, go for it. Right? The way that I see this is that I see this as a far establishing shot. This is the first time we're seeing them in the car. This is the first time we're seeing them on the road. So that's why I felt that it was more important to pull back and give a sense of place and setup so that we know we can tell from the dialogue that it's there. We can tell from the angle that they are in a car. If the artist wanted to take panel A and split it into two panels to start with a wide shot and then go tight in, he can do that if he is so inclined, as long as he can make sure to get the rest of the panels on the page. Because notice that it's a six panel page. If he wants to make it a seven panel page by starting with a far shot and then going in tight, Fantastic. But you should not start with the tight shot because since this is the first panel and it's a new scene, the, the viewer, the reader, will have no idea where the hell they are because the previous panel of the previous last panel of the previous page was a close up shot. You can't have two close up shots if you're changing scene. Always have that shot. What was that? Always have that do you always have to have an establishing shot? Not always. If, for example, you've already set up where you are and then you're cutting back to it so that the viewer has, so the audience has a sense of the place, then you don't really need an establishing shot. I tend to like them because I just figure that it gives the, the reader a better sense of where they are. But you always have to be aware of where you're flowing from the previous page. Could I have started this with a close-up? Yes, but not from where I left it on the previous page. It would have just been confusing as hell. You can't really go from close-up to one place to close-up to another place unless you're going to do a caption. So I could have close, I could end here with a close-up on having it on, on close-up on Polaris and Banshee. And then the next thing had to be another close-up, but then going to have to stick a caption in there that says, two hours later on a road to Westchester. I could do that. Seems a little clunky. Would rather go for the establishing shot. Yeah. If the artist goes for it. We're not going to get past panel one. Yeah. If the artist goes for it and you don't like it, but the other referee has a final say. Um, okay. the, the editor does have final say. Generally speaking, believe me, I'll tell you this from experience. Generally speaking, the editor will say to the writer, can you make it work? You know, because it's way easier to fix it with words than it is to have the artist redraw. There was one time, though, where I just absolutely put my foot down. I had a sequence in Spider-Man 2099 that had, that, in which I had the climactic fight end with the Spider-Man versus the bad guy in a certain way. And Rick Leonardo, the artist, decided that he had a much better way of finishing it and had Spider-Man 2099 maneuver it so that the bad guy gets hit by a train. Now it was very, it was very compelling. It was visually interesting, 
and it was beat for beat identical to a story that I had done in X Factor that was coming out one week later. And I went totally batshit and I went to the editor and said, we can't do this. People are going to say, what the hell is up with Peter David and Trains this month? It's going to seem to people who read all my stuff that I'm repeating myself. We can't do it. And he went back to Rick Leonardi and said, you've got to redraw it, and here's why. And Rick redid, you know, he wasn't happy about it, but he redid it the way that I told him to. And if only he had just freaking called me, I could have stopped him. But I made it up to him because a year and a half later, when we brought back the villain, this time, when I got to that point of the story, I said, and then we use Rick's ending. So Rick managed to get ahead on that issue because we then dropped in the sequence with the train, which was fine because it was a year and a half later from X Factor, and it's not going to be quite so evident. People won't think that I completely run out of ideas. Yeah? Some of them were Depends on the artist. Depends on the artist, depends on the editor. Ideally, everything gets ciphered for the editor, but if it's okay with the editor and the writer and artist want to talk to each other, absolutely no problem. As far as I'm concerned, it's whatever the editor and the uh, and the uh, artist, you know, whatever they want to do in terms of their comfortable. Okay, so moving on. Um, great. Okay, was, okay, angle on police on Polaris and Teresa. Notice that I don't get always specific with the angles. I want to leave it up to the artist as much as possible to arrange the camera where he thinks it's going to be the most interesting. Usually the most detail I will get is say different angle or over the shoulder angle. Okay? Although again, if the artist has a better way to tell it, fantastic. Polaris, you should have seen her back in the day, Terry. She was crushing on Alex something fierce. No kidding? Was not, word two, Notice, kids, proper grammar. Was not, word two. Don't forget the pronoun that would be there. Well, Teresa, she would be saying I, and Polaris would be saying you. So it has to be I was not, you were two. Was not, was two, were not, were two. Totally bad grammar. Grammar is your friend. What is, oh yeah, I don't have to tell you because you're looking at it. Uh, closer on Teresa and Polaris. Was she in heat or something? That was one theory, yeah. La la la, not listening. I'm not listening. Keep a, just so you know, that was a little throwback to the storyline that I wrote back in X Factor, in which I wanted to establish that the reason that she was crushing on Alex was that she was indeed in heat. And after I left the book for other reasons, they totally rewrote that and took that out. So, because I had a sequence in there, in that in her own issue of X Factor, which was new at the time, where Rain is walking down the street wondering why she's so obsessed with Alex. And as she's walking past a series of dogs, all the dogs start going nuts. <laughs> as in, and all the male dogs are like, <gasps> like that as she's walking past. And she realizes to her horror, oh my god, I'm in heat. Uh, which totally freaks her out. And that panel and that page did see print, but they completely changed the dialogue. So if you go back and look like an X Factor 89 or something, or whatever it was. No, not 89. Like, uh, Whatever it was toward the very end of my run. You see that? They totally rewrote it. It's one of the reasons I left. Um, so what I got from it, she was now a little bit Closer on Polaris, leaning forward. Oh, great, now we A massive tree has fallen across the road in front of them. Police cars are there. If you can fit them in, show cars on either side of the road have to come to a halt. But if the artist can't fit them in, fantastic, they're not really necessary. One cop is speaking through a microphone. The crashed tree, which has fallen at an angle, has also smashed through the guardrail and the drop to the left. Notice that there are a lot of elements in this panel. Notice that instead of being six panels, it's now four. I'm trying to give them enough room to convey this. Also notice that although there are a lot of elements, it's fairly stacked. Right? I haven't given the artist too much to do. Please turn around and find another route. This is going to take several hours to remove. Teresa says, have standing, she has a smirk. Want to bet? Cover your ears, girls. This could get a little loud. And Rain says, oh, here we go. Why do I put this sequence in that does nothing to further the story? We get to see Teresa's superpower. She lets out a direct sonic scream. The scream hits the tree, smash, shattering into splinters. Do the cops say, thank you very much? No, of course not. The cops throw their weapons. Whoever, whatever you are, get out of the car. Now, this nicely is a call back to the fact that in the Marvel Universe, mutants are feared. They don't know what their deal is, so they are assuming the worst. 
B, angle on the girl in the car. Polaris is grinning grimly. Teresa is smiling as well. Rain looks concerned. Polaris, remember Thelma and Louise? Oh, you're evil. Wait, what? And the car hurdles forward. Notice, again, I've broken up the actions. I don't have her driving the car forward while talking. The car veers right toward the newly created gap in the railing fence, no longer polarized. Hold it, don't! And the car sails off the road. Again, a single action. Angle on the horrified cops approaching. Holy crap, crazy board, it's the average thing I've ever seen. Full page. Why? Because this is the one that I want to put some emotional pop to. You know, there are fun-loving mutant girls on the road. This is, so we have this full panel that shows all the elements of that. And Teresa says, Lord Danner said this, Polaris says, suck it, Ron Weasley. Who needs a magical clocker when you can manipulate magnetic waves, not to mention metal? Why did I put this in? Because this is the first time you always have to assume, particularly for writing a superhero book, an ongoing series, that this is going to be somebody's first issue. I want to drive home to them how it is, what Polaris's powers are, and how they work. So I have to give an expository line in there. I try to make it as elegant as I can, but it has to be in there to accommodate the reader, okay? particularly if it's a new one. Gray says, I think I may be sick. Polaris says, well, good thing the roof's down, huh? We've got a headwind, so if you barf, just make sure you face the back. Nangle on the car as it's sailing through the air. Notice that it's a downside, I'm just angle. Man, too bad Monet and Layla missed this. You invited them, right? Yeah, so why didn't they come? Now, how many people watch House? The TV series House. Well, I guess this is why it's getting canceled. Um, <laughs> one of the things that House, Dr. House always says is that people always lie. People lie. Now, this is so true in life because, you know, guys, primarily guys here, you come home and your significant other is sitting there like this. <laughs> Honey, what's wrong? Does she give you five minutes of exposition telling you exactly what's on her mind? No. What's the answer? Nothing. Right? Obviously, there's something. And how you get it that something is digging down. It's always a lot more fun in comic books to have somebody say what's not on their minds than just be honest, because in real life, I mean, you know, Peter, how are you feeling? Oh, I'm fine. Am I really going to tell him my right knee is bothering the living crap out of me? Am I going to tell him that, you know, I feel the cold's coming on? Actually, yes, I would, because I'm a middle-aged Jew. Okay? In point of fact, never ask a middle-aged Jew how he's feeling, he will tell you. Okay? But Gentiles, how are you feeling, right? Your back will be spazzing and something physical. Oh, I'm fine. We will just unload to the point where we just want to blow your brains out. Okay? But generally speaking, people tend to not always be forthcoming. And that can be sometimes used for interesting effects. So, Polaris says, so why did they come? Half-tone flashback camp panel. Close shot on Layla, looking into camera. We're basically breaking the fourth wall here, but I'm trying to go for a specific effect. Layla says, I get car sick pretty easily. You don't want me along. Same exact type of panel, except this time it's Monet. Seven hours in the car with Sinclair? Have you listened to her lately? The girl would make string burn weep. Forget it, I'd rather have a marlin spike through my head. Back to Teresa, they were busy. Right? There's no advantage to her to saying that they didn't want to be anywhere near, the, or at least Monet didn't want to be anywhere near rain. They're trying to make her feel better. So that would be counterproductive. Rain leans forward. Teresa, I'm not stupid. What are you not telling me? Honestly, so now, after a bit of obfuscation, she can actually be more candid. She says, it'd be a nice change of pace. All right, is there a mission? Teresa says, in a manner of speaking, and you're it. Ray looks down, and Ray now doesn't want any part of this. Great, just land this bucket anywhere. I'll be on my way. I came that close to having her changed into a wolf for the purpose of this, but decided it was too much, right? So it's, oh no, it did, that's right, it did happen, okay, that's right, whatever, he wrote it, ha ha ha, I'm so good, okay. So here, now we have Rain being able to demonstrate her power, okay, great, just line this bucket anywhere, I'll be on my way. Rain, come on, look, if anyone knows what you're going through, I didn't want your sympathy or your help. And in her half-full form, she leaps out of the flying car. Forget it, I'll just get out of here. 
Rain comes back, get back air. And suddenly, rain is propelled by seemingly the air itself into the back seat of the car. Polaris has her hand raised and waves are emanating from it. At this point, I do not have to explain how Polaris is doing this. We've already established that she can manipulate magnetic waves. Right? So now, we just go, oof. And Polaris, now putting aside all nice things, says, you know what? I'm so sick of the Dower Scotts thing, I'm ready to nuke Glasgow on general principles. Now listen carefully, you mangy little brat. Banshee may be handling you with kid gloves and that's fine. But me, I knew you went and I've had it. You're disrupting the team and depressing the hell out of me. So keep your ass nailed in that backseat car, nail it for you. Clear. And Rain, who shifted back to human form, looking some Cal. Yes, ma'am. Coast on Polaris and Teresa. Teresa says, excellent. And Polaris says, I'm a people person. It's a gift. Now, this is five, how many pages is this? This is four. This is five pages of characterization in a comic book. Notice that I've managed to display their powers, have them essentially speak about their problems, but done it in a way that I hope is compellingly visual. If you take away the flying car, if you take away Polaris demonstrating her power, if you take away uh, Banshee, it's like Game of Thrones without nudity. It's four to five pages of people talking, but that's all it is. That's not, did, I, did anyone not get one of these? Okay, because I have now my extra. You have, okay. This is the way that you are able to convey visually your story and get exposition across and get characterization across, but not just have it be five pages of three people sitting in a car talking, because visually that's going to be anathema, which is bad. Now, here's one other thing I want to show you guys. This is from a recent issue of X Factor. Here you go. Right there. Okay. If you could pass those down, to someone who's like, why am I doing this? Oh, wait a minute, I need one to actually look at this. Completely. This is from a recent issue of X Factor. Now, what I have here is three pages of dialogue, okay, and script. Then, I have attached to it the actual pages, so you can see what the artist did and where I basically kind of screwed up, or the artist screwed up, depending upon how you want to look at it. Okay. This has a, this is from a climactic scene in which Jamie Mandrox has been ricocheting from one dimension to another to another. He's wound up in a, while his body, which was actually killed in a previous episode of X Factor, issue of X Factor, has been sitting in a cooler of ice where Layla Miller, uh, the young woman who actually loves him, has been sitting vigil. Okay? Now, this is a classic mythic trope. The man off on an adventure while the woman is sitting there waiting and praying for him to come back and being ever vigilant and ever the center. Probably the most famous version of this would be from, from the Odyssey, where Ulysses' wife, Penelope, is sitting there waiting for him and, and absolutely determined in her faithfulness and beating off all the other suitors during the lengthy and during the lengthy absence of Ulysses. So having Layla Miller now filling this role goes to that, that classic depiction of you know devotion and certainty that he will come back and she's certain that you know that he will. I mean because people coming up are going, he's dead, he's not coming back, and they're trying to be consoling, and in previous issues Layla was saying, get the hell away from me, he's coming back. Okay? Because we're in a comic book and death is, you know. So this is at the climax of that preview, so go through this quickly. And Madrox falls headfirst into the vortex. The balloon says, James, no, I don't have to indicate who says that. Dr. Strange is the only one in the room. Okay? The vortex wraps it back in on itself, and then it's bouncing and it's gone. Angle on Dr. Strange there, looking at where the vortex, ha vortex had been, but no longer is. And he says, and the balloon, because at this point, he's kind of, Dr. Strange is kind of like a ghostly individual. Okay? So the reason that I don't have him, the balloon, having a pointer 
is because he's not really there. So in order to give it a more weird effect, I have it being a balloon. And I should emphasize this is something I kind of glossed over before we go further. There's lots of things you can do with balloons. As we said, fun with balloons. This is a standard, well, that looks terrible, but that's more like Squidward from this. But basically, this is the standard issue balloon. Okay, very straightforward. Now, let's say that you want to convey a whisper. You break up the balloon. Okay? Let's say you want to convey a thought, and thought balloons are not quite as common as they used to be. They've been replaced stylistically by narrative captions more often than not. But a thought balloon looks like a little cloud. Now, Let's say that you're talking to someone who is really, you know, so I don't like you're late for dinner again, or you know, you betrayed us to Doctor Doom, or whatever. You can convey something. This is one of my favorites. I use it every now and then. You don't want to overuse anything, but you have little frost dripping off the balloon to convey the notion that the person is talking like this. How many people watch Frasier? Lilith, every word balloon, from, if Lilith were in a comic book, every word balloon would look like that. Okay? Um, you can have explosive word balloons. That actually looks like a leaf, but it's supposed to be an explosion. That is terrible. So, so the writer gets to decide these things? Yep. These are all tools in the writer's toolbox. You can now, you can even play with the word appearance in. You can have what? If you really want to go nuts, you can have the word go outside of the balloon. What? You are so shocked even your word balloon can't contain it. Um, I have, uh, Danny, can you think of any others off the top of your head? Uh, um, there's the burst, there's... Yo, that's the burst over there. Um, oh, oh, oh. The, oh. Du the double thickness balloon. The, the what? Uh, double yeah. thickness, uh... I don't know where you really... I know, I've seen people use the double thickness, and I'm really not sure where you use that. I think it means you're talking in a... Yeah, that's true. Kind of voice. You can mess, yeah, you can mess with the borders. If you have, like, a gigantic alien, or something like that, and you want to indicate you can mess with the borders of the balloon to make it really dark. Um, I mean, you can make the white on black lettering for it. Well, yeah, well, that's, yeah, that becomes a whole lettering decision, but you can do that. Um, here's one that I like to do on occasion. When the character is absolutely speechless, this is something that I picked up from manga. If the character is absolutely, you don't want to just have an empty word balloon because the reader's going to think that the letter is screwed up. So if you want to have a person going, because he's got nothing to say, you go like this. And like I said, I got this from manga, it's great. Just a little elliptic, a little, you have a little ellipsis in there, so the person's going like, you know, I have to take a moment. Okay, got it. So that's, that, that's, that's a fun little one. Um, you want to convey love, someone is absolutely over their, 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 they're absolutely over the top, you know, That was terrible. Hold on. I have no No, that looks like something touching. Hold on. There we go. Yes, you can actually get away with that. I wouldn't recommend it all the time. But yes, you can actually get away with having dialogue in a word balloon. Most effective with teenagers. Okay, you have the teenage protagonist, male, female, doesn't matter. You can get away with that. If, however, you have an upset female protagonist, and this generally only works with an upset teenage girl, you can also have, if you want to show that a heart's being broken, you can literally do that. You know, you can have her dialogue in the thing, like, you know, you're breaking up with me? You can, add, you can actually get away. If, if you want to show that a character is nervous, you can have a wavery line around it, really want to try and sell it, you can actually have beads of perspiration 
flying from it. Yeah, if you want to see some of the most demented use of uh, balloons, go check out Mamba because they are freaking amazing. The stuff that they come up with. Maybe it's a quarter to ten. So okay, let me get through this and then we're done. Okay, so we're not going to talk about Watchmen. Sorry. Um, so, I'm going to be on the trail for you. All right. So, where were we? Right, so, um, Doc Strange is standing there, James, I'm, and Doc begins to vanish altogether. I'm so sorry, and then there's nothing there, and then there's a blackout man. We have another blackout man. Then we see Mandrox's hand pushing up against the blackness as if it has substance. And the caption narrative, which is to replace the skull balloons, cold, so, so cold. Then the object he's pushing against is pushed open, and we see the ceiling of the morgue. So I'm going for a really different kind of point of view shot. Where am I? The Arctic. Tell them what we've done um, Hands numb, can barely feel. I have to say, in terms of narrative, not my best. Not my best. I'm trying to convey a kind of disconnected thing that's always a little tricky and not have to look stupid on the page. And the hand so that reaches down, gripping his. Ah, okay, that, that's good. That's reverse angle, Madrox being hauled up. That's warm. Yes, warm. Feeling much. Full page is Layla holding the out of the container she had him in, kissing him passionately. He's basically wearing a black rubber suit like a skin diver's outfit, complete with the headpiece. Yes, so much better. Now, that's what I wrote. Let's look what the artist did. So, we have the first panel. There's Madrox falling headfirst into the vortex. James, no. He chose to put in a word balloon pointer. Thanks a freaking lot. The vortex wraps back in on itself. Now I have to say, a panel that says that the vortex wraps back in on itself, that was a pretty crappy panel description on my side. <laughs> I look at it now, I'm going, and how the hell do you draw that? Because like I said, writing is a constant learning process. And if you don't look at your stuff and go, whoa, I screwed the pooch on that one, at least once a year or twice a year or like once a month, you're not learning. So the vortex wraps back in on itself. Considering that that is an almost impossible image to convey, I've got to say the artist did a pretty good job. Now, panel three, and it's gone. Okay, perfect. Now, here's uh, panel, panel D. Angle on Doc Strange standing there, looking at the vortex, has been, but no longer is. Not the angle I would have chosen. I would have gone in a little bit closer for Doc, maybe put it over the shoulder. But he chose to do a wide shot. Okay, fair enough. Now, panel E, Doc begins to vanish altogether. Does that look like he's vanishing? No, and, but part of that is my fault because he's a ghostly image and I forgot to consider the fact that how do you convey that the ghost is starting to vanish considering he's semi-transparent anyway. Then we have the final one, and then there's nothing there. Now, I want you to look at that panel that second to last panel, and separate it in your mind from everything else that's going on on the page. What the hell is happening in that panel? Can anyone tell? Because I sure as hell can't. There's just, it's just, if you separate it from everything else, it's just this, this weird little burst. There's not a direct connection to what happened just before. You don't know that it's Doc. I could have solved this, or I could have avoided this by continuing a word balloon and having it go there, and then having the word balloon do this. I could have put a little thing where I chop off and have a little burst at the end of the uh, balloon to indicate that it's something that was stopped and didn't talk. But I didn't do that. Instead, because I'm a schmuck, I just left that empty. So we've got a second panel, a penultimate panel, which is essentially a complete waste of space because we don't know what's happening. You could have easily just left the background of the I, I yeah, There was a number of things I could have done. There was a number of things that the artist could have done. I think the artist dropped the ball, but I'm the one who threw it to, you know, under his mitt. <laughs> then we have the panel. We have the blackout panel. Fantastic. Another blackout panel. Hard to mess up a blackout panel, although it has been done. Then we see Mandrox's hand coming into panel. Perfect. We then have the object, we see that it's the ceiling of the moor. Perfect. Okay? It's giving you the point of view. Now, a hand suddenly reaches down, dripping his. Excellent. Now, here's where I think the artist was really creative. Reverse angle, Madrox being hauled upward. 
Notice that I have not stated in the panel that Laelot is the one who's calling him up. It is, that's because I didn't want to reveal yet that it was Laelot. The artist, rather than going on a close angle with Madrox, decided to go wide to give the audience a clear shot of the giant crate of ice that she's pulling them out of. But he wanted to honor my desire not to do the reveal on Layla. What did he do? This was freaking brilliant. He covered her with the panel. He blocks out any clear view of Layla to preserve the reveal. It's not really a terrific reveal. Anyone who read the previous issue knows who it is. But nevertheless, he does it in order to block the reveal of Layla and keep consistent with what I wanted. Turn the page. Here is the full page that has this major emotional moment. He knocks it out of the freaking park, in my opinion. But here's what I love in particular about this page. It's not just that they're kissing. It's not just the emotion. I love his boots. Because look at the detail that the artist, and I didn't ask for this, right? But the artist chose to add even more detail, detail to it by putting unbelievable definition into the sole of the guy's boots. We have artists out there who don't like to draw feet, and here's this artist putting unspeakable detail into his soles. As the writer, it would never occur to me to say he's wearing a particular type of boot, much less what goes into it. But the artist has this kind of detail that he adds to it to give greater definition to what you're seeing on the page. So as an artist, so as a writer, with the I feel like this is a terrific example of how you, as the writer, should always be thinking of what mundane details can I put into this to give it more reality, to make it more grounded in the world, and give it, and just give it a more sense of that you are actually there. What was the artist? I think I think this is Leonard. It, I think this is Leonard Kirk. I think it's Leonard. It could also be. It could also be Emmanuel. I, I, don't, I know, I, I know, it's kind of, actually, no, you know what, I, I think we're back. I think this may, no, this, I'm not sure. If I want to look, this might be Emanuela because the kiss looks passionate enough that it's her. Um, so we're wrapping up. I want to mention that, as I showed you before, I have a book called Writing for Comics and Graphic Novels by me. Um, I don't, I didn't bring copies to sell simply because I really didn't feel like schlepping it from Penn Station. Okay. However, it, it has many of the things that I've discussed, plus many examples and many other things that I didn't have time for in three hours. Um, so if you are interested, you can write to me at PadGuy, P-A-D-G-U-Y-C. We'll put away your pens and paper. Teacher didn't say we were done. You can contact me at PadGuy at AOL.com and order copies, um, or you can write to me by snail mail if you want to send checks to, uh, to a P.O. Box 239, Bayport, B-A-Y-P-O-R-T, New York, 11705. That's my snail mail. That's my email address. If you want to order copies, it's $25. It's $5 for shipping mail. Okay. Or, you, or you can get them in your local comic book store. Or you can have your local comic book store order them. Or if you have your local orders. <laughs> Um, or you can go to Amazon, whatever. But so, there's, so you can actually buy them from like real book places. Mm -hmm. Also, um, for those, oh, now one of the real quick thing, people are always asking, what's the best way to get into Marvel and DC? And I just checked with Marvel and DC. And, well, not with DC, with Marvel. And they highly recommend trying to go the self publishing route to get your return. It used to be 30 years ago that was useless advice. Now it's unbelievable. You can use the internet to find artists. You can use the internet to get your work out there. And you put out comics. You know, if you want to do comic books, you put out your comics, you publish them online, and then you contact editors, you contact Marvel, specifically at Marvel Comics, you would contact C.B. Cebulski. That's letter C, letter B, Cebulski, C. U-L-S-K-I, and tell them where they can go online to check out your material. Now, I 
have to say, as a writer, I'm totally candid, as a writer, it's much harder to break in than it is as an artist. Because you have to find the artist who's then going to be able to convey your work in a way that doesn't turn off the reader. And I can tell you, speaking of someone who's had some unbelievably crap-ass artists from time to time, it's not always easy. It's a very, it's a very hard road to hope. Um, going up to editors at conventions is a good way to make contacts, put a face to a name, that kind of thing. But don't go walking up to an editor with your story out or your proposal or there was the guy who came to walk to the Marvel uh, to the Marvel booth at San Diego with a treatise this thick of how he wanted to take over and wipe out all the current Marvel heroes and replace and replace them with all of his own heroes, and was very surprised that nobody at Marvel wanted to go for that. Um, also, I mean, and there there actually can be legal aspects, so don't bother going to a writer with your material. Because I, speaking for myself at least, there are serious legal problems. And I'll give you one example and then we'll, we'll cut it off. All the cops are coming for you. Um, which is this. I was working at San Diego Convention. And this guy came up to me and he said, now I was working for Marvel, I was a sales manager. He was saying, no, well, whatever, no, I had a table there. But a guy came up to me and said, I was really hoping you would read this story. It's, it's only a two page story. But it's, I, I'm really proud and I'm talking to you. And I go like, fine, because I really have anything else going on. And I read it, and it was this lovely, lovely story involving Sue Richards, who had had a miscarriage. And she was in mourning for her child, and she had found, and, and however it was, she finds that there's, a, that there's an alternate reality where the child survived and grew up and is living a happy life, and she takes personal solace from this. And it was and it was touching, and it was publishable. It was absolutely 100% publishable. And I read this, and I went, oh my god. And I said, wait here. And I went over to the Marvel booth. That's how I was in sales at that. And Mark Grunewald was there, the late, great Mark Grunewald. And I said, Mark, would you mind reading this? And Mark stands there and reads this. And I see the same thing on his face that I knew him, which had been on mine, which was, Oh my God, this is published. And he said, who wrote this? And I said, he's over there. And I brought Mark over to him. And you should have seen the kid's face when he sees me coming with Mark Brunewald. So, you know, I'm bringing Bruni over, you know. And Mark told him that he thought it was wonderful, that it would make a terrific Marvel fanfare story, which was absolutely what I thought also. And he said, I'm going to bring it to the fanfare editor. And, you know, and, and you'll be hearing from us. And Mark brings it to the fanfare editor. The fanfare editor pulls open a drawer and pulls out a story, and it was almost identical. And he said, we've had this in the works for about four months now. The story's complete. It's actually going to be going into the fanfare. You know what? Shit happens. And Mark contacted the company, and he said, look, this is a brilliant story. We loved it, unfortunately. We're doing something just like it for Marvel fanfare. But we would be really interested in hearing other pictures from you. Now, the kid had an older brother who was a lawyer who said, they're ripping you off. You're getting screwed over. And he went to bat for his kid brother, which is horrible for a, an older brother to do, I suppose. But it just, that was it. That was freaking it. He went after Marvel, and Marvel was able to prove, no, this story was written back here, and you know, all that kind of stuff. So we were able to provide irrefutable proof, but that was it. The kid that had no shot at working for Marvel, because, uh, because who needs this on a regular basis? So this is one of the reasons why comic book companies are very cautious, and why writers like myself go, ah, whenever people approach us for some reason. And because I sure learned the lesson, you know, so that's why Marvel, at least, wants stuff that's already out in the public venue that's been published out there so that anyone can see it and it's public so you can send Marvel to go look at it and if they think it's good, they'll get back in touch with you and say, okay, pitch us some ideas. 
So, you know, how you go about getting an artist, someday you, you know, you've got to bring in somebody here at MOCA who's really expert in getting stuff published online and have them do a talk about, uh, about online publishing because that's a whole other evening and a whole other discussion. So at any rate, uh, there's a, uh, we're not going to dissect Watchmen tonight. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, good luck and best of luck with your, and I will, I will put it to you this way, okay? Last thing, when I was 25, it was a very good no. When I was 25, 26, like that, I went to a Stephen King book signing, back to Stephen King's book signing. And I brought him a copy of one of his books, and I said, Mr. King, I just want you to know that I'm an aspiring writer. And he wrote on the book, Do Peter, best of luck with your writing career. Okay? 25 years later, I'm sitting at a New York Comic Con panel launching The Dark Tower, and I'm on a panel with several Marvel editors, and Art J. Lee, the artist, Robin Firth, the co writer, and sitting immediately to my right, Stephen King. And a fan gets up and he says, I just want you guys to know that Peter David is my favorite comic book writer and Stephen King is my favorite novelist. So this project is like a dream for me. And Stephen King and I turn and we high five each other. Okay, so all I'm saying, I guess, in the spirit of where things can go and knowing where the road will take you, best of luck with your writing. Thank you. Thank you, Peter.